The Board of Selectmen's meeting for Tuesday, November 5th. Could I have everybody's attention, please? We're going to start with some brief announcements. The outdoor farmer's market is over, but all is not lost. The winter farmer's market has begun and will be held on Sundays from noon until 5 p.m. in the Arcade Building in Coolidge Corner. This Thursday at 6.30 p.m. in Huntington Hall of the Main Library, there will be a panel discussion based on the book, The New Jim Crow, by law professor Michelle Alexander, discussing how the criminal justice system has put a disproportionate number of racial minorities in prison and the long-term consequences of this incarceration. Changing the subject, this Friday and Saturday, starting at 10 a.m., don't miss the annual holiday craft sale at the Brookline Senior Center, 93 Winchester Street. Do you have anything you want to add to that, Slightman Daly? Oh, no, this is always uh, always fun, and uh, I know they look forward Lots to Lots of neat stuff. I've, yeah. I've certainly gotten gifts from there. Um, and next Tuesday, the Board of Selectmen will be holding a public hearing on the proposal to add 192 units to housing of housing at Hancock Village under the state Chapter 40B comprehensive permit process. Also next week, on Wednesday in this room, the Brookline Neighborhood Alliance, the Town Meeting Members Association, and the League of Women Voters will hold a discussion on warrant articles that will come before the special town meeting in November. Any other announcements, comments from members of the board? Seeing, oh yes, I'm sorry. No, that's all right. I, I want to take Mr. this Kleckner. opportunity to just to let the, uh, the board know and the community know that um, we are embarking on a citizen survey. Uh, as you may recall, last year I proposed within the fiscal year 14 budget, uh, the funding of a citizen survey as part of the town's larger effort to quantify performance and to better tailor funding of the town's priorities. And we have chosen to participate in the National Citizen Survey, which is a, pro uh, which is a collaboration between the International City Management Association and the National Research Center Incorporated. It offers a statistically valid and tested survey instrument with questions that are uniform that allows us to compare ourselves with other municipalities across the United States and for our own community over time if we choose to do the survey over um, multiple times. There is an option for a few customized questions and we will take advantage of this, but for this year we're focusing these questions on how we engage citizens in an effort to quantify the preferred methods and characteristics of communications and involvement in our local government. But I did want the board to know another, so that in the future we may wish to facilitate some more substantial uh, customized policy questions as part of the survey. So just prior to Thanksgiving, uh, 1,200 randomly selected households in Brookline will receive this survey, and we're really looking forward to seeing the results and more formally present them to the Board of Selectmen, the Advisory Committee, and others later this spring. Um, our CIO, Kevin Stokes, is here if you have any questions about that, but uh, we are going to be uh, letting 1,200 households know that they've been selected and um, will be participating in the survey over the next uh, few weeks. Questions, comments, Selectman Daly? No. No. That sounds good. I thought I saw your hand up. Okay, then we'll move to the miscellaneous Oh, agenda. no, I actually sorry. just had another item, though, I wanted oh. to mention. Go ahead. I I'm just sorry. wanted to remind people that uh, the, this coming Monday is Veterans Day, and there will be the uh, oh, right. Veterans Day observance at 11 o'clock on Monday the 11th at in front of Town, Town Hall. Hall. Right. Sorry, I forgot about that. Um, okay, and then we will move to our miscellaneous items, uh, the first being an extension of the noise bylaw waiver originally granted. Um, members of the board will remember we held uh, quite a lengthy discussion about a noise bylaw waiver for 46 White Place um, and, and took a vote which um, limited what they were permitted to do. Um, and we understand that a combination of weather, perhaps Red Sox and other MBTA um, priorities have prevented them from completing the construction that was uh, intended and they've asked for an extension and um, I just would like to say for the record that uh, we've been advised by town council that we do have the authority to provide a time extension. So are there questions for any, from anybody about this? I think we pretty thoroughly discussed it before. No? Do, do you have anything you want to add to what I've said? 
No? If it's approved, then, then no. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, um, right, right. Uh, what I can tell you is that we're allowed to extend it through November 7th, which is Thursday. Most likely that will be good if the tea Okay, if the tea, tea cooperates off, and it yeah. doesn't rain. I got it. Right. All right, well, I suppose worst case is we might have to do it again. Um, so, members of the board, you all understand what we're being... But if it, the worst case, they would have to be back here next Tuesday. That's right. So are we, are we limited to Thursday? Can we be a little more flexible? Um, I'm not prepared to say more than what I was given by town council. Okay. Just um, I think I, I think that that was what was requested. I think that's okay. why she responded with that. Date. Okay. So is that what town council requested? Because that's not what I requested. That's not what you asked for. Said that the um, said the T is granting. Well, what, what what's the tea giving you? The tea is allowing us for sure this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then after that. Okay, so in fact, that's why she said the seventh, because that's right. what the tea that's agreed to. That's what the tea is allowing, but they're they're not saying up only then. They'll give us more if if for some reason they've canceled us. They'll just keep giving us a day here and there. But 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 what was no, just to clarify what was noticed in the calendar, and therefore what the abutters if they chose yeah. to. Uh, see the calendar. See the calendar and participate in this. Had notice of was November seventh. Okay. So let's let's say we regret that we have to put the limitation, but we do now understand that we have the authority to extend the waiver, and so with good luck you will not come back, and with bad luck we will extend the waiver. How's that? Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I move that we grant the application of owners of 46 White Place, Brookline, for an extension of the noise bylaw waiver originally granted on October 22nd, 2013, after a public hearing, and extending the terms of such waiver through November 7th, 2013. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Binka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. Good luck. Thank you. And next we have some interviews, and the first person is Valencia Sparrow. Welcome. I see you've brought your assistant. Yes. Well, we're pretty much a team. We are a team. So, Larry. Uh, Larry should excuse stand me. With me. No, Larry's standing with me in case I lose my balance. Ah, okay. Sorry, didn't understand that. <laughs> um, so please just tell us about yourself and why you're interested in the Human Relations Youth Resources Commission. Well, would you like... The um, short version. Educational? Sorry. <laughs> oh, a short version. Okay. Well... I'm interested in the Human Relations Commission because of the diversity in Brookline and where I live is Coolidge Corner and it's extremely diverse. You walk down the street, you hear at least eight to ten different languages and um, in reading in the papers I began to become concerned with the statistics that were being reported about the hiring processes in Brookline and um, whether or not they reflected the diversity of the city. And so I heard that this commission was one that would um, kind of help to monitor those processes as well as other issues. And I just, you know, I just, I love the city. I've been here for about 17 years. And I just want to see it united. And I think the one thing that really turned me to be here today is that I was in a CVS and a woman and her husband, with a, ba a woman with a baby carriage and a husband we're blocking an aisle. And I had my wheelchair, and I said, excuse me. And she didn't look at me and ignore me. She looked past me. 
And I don't know if anybody knows what it feels like to be looked past as if you're invisible. But it's crushing. And when I left, I thought, I don't ever want anybody else, a child, elderly, black, white, yellow, red, to have that feeling of being looked past. I'm, I'm getting choked up now. Oh, please. I, I'm going to ask you a sort of technical question that, that might help you sort of get Thank back you. into focus. I'm sorry, but that's, that's okay. what brought me here. Sure, sure, and we very much appreciate that. Are you aware of the bylaw and the fact that it's under review by, right now by a diversity committee? Now, which bylaw are you speaking of? The bylaw establishing the commission. Um, I've been told about it. I haven't seen it in writing. Okay. Do you know what the bylaw says? Do you understand what being a member of the commission and under the bylaw means? Well, I understand that it means that I have to attend the meetings. It means that um, a participation and um, if you're asking me, do I understand what I'm promising to do in accepting Probably, this? Probably, yeah. <laughs> that, that's how I'm, I'm interpreting your question. Not totally. Okay. It's possible there will be some changes. And I, I well, mean, actually, the committee, I the committee that's that. studying this may recommend changes. That was part of the question. Well, see, what I, I understood and from the meetings that I've been attending, everything's in process. Okay. Because I'm not clear. Everything's being created for the committee. The, the, the meetings I have, ten, have attended over the past few weeks, I've heard, well, we'll have the committee do X, or we'll have the committee do Y. Or maybe the committee can do this. Well, what responsibility? Well, what power are we giving to the committee? So no, I'm not clear exactly what I'm promising. Actually, I think you got it pretty clear. It's in transition. Mm -hmm. I know as an individual what I'll promise. And as an individual, what I'll promise is to be there, to give 100% of myself, um, to treat each person with respect and listen to their side. Of, of the story and see what we can work out. Okay, questions for members of the board? Yeah, I, I wonder if you have any thoughts or on uh, any programs or anything that you would like to suggest to the, to the commission were you to be a member that might further the goals you're talking about. Well, I wouldn't want to be a member, but at the last meeting I had attended, I had and there was a discussion about um, funding programs for youth. I had mentioned that maybe a public-private partnership program where mm -hmm. um, the companies that exist in Brookline could maybe do some type of funding or profit matching, you know, funding matching mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the public to help the youth, I guess, get, you know, pay for their sports equipment or whatever. That was one, no, I, um, I'm not willing to be part of that. I'm, I'm interesting in, interesting in, interested in um, more of the disability end and looking at um, what's available for the disabled in Brookline. For example, during the winter time, the areas for our wheelchairs are never shoveled out. So uh -huh. even when it's not snowing or after a storm, a couple of days after a storm, we're still not able to travel on a sidewalk. We have to use the street because there's no way for us to, to, get, to get off the sidewalk. 
Okay. Um, the, the town actually the does day. have a disability commission too, and you might send them a letter. Or oh, I'll be I'll be talking yeah. to them. Yes. But I mean, do, what I I what about any programs maybe to educate the public about some of the challenges the disabled face or. I haven't quite thought about that. And the reason why I haven't thought about that, again, is because of the meetings I've attended and everything is still in the development process. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for me to be sure of what I'm going to do when I haven't, I don't have anything solid to spring from. Right, okay. Yep. Could I just actually Such just a make up. a comment? Uh, uh, thank you for applying. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I just wanted to make a comment about your uh, concern about uh, the shoveling of, of streets and Boy. so forth. I um, the, yes. The Commission for the Disabled actually um, has sort of a standing process uh -huh. with um, the Department of Public Works. Mm -hmm. And one of the commissioners uh, of the Commission for the Disabled uh, meets with uh, uh, Andy Papasturgeon, our DPW mm -hmm. commissioner, and uh, meets with Kevin Johnson, who's mm -hmm. uh, responsible for highways. And the town actually has um, made a, a real commitment to uh, getting the uh, crosswalks and the ramps and, and so forth uh, cleared out. Mm -hmm. And if there's uh, an area where that hasn't happened, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, you should certainly get in touch with uh, whatever happens with this appointment. Yes. You know, as a citizen. Yes. Uh, and this really goes for all citizens. Um, uh, they should get in touch with the Commissioner of Public Works, with Andy Papasturgeon, uh, and also um, uh, the Commission for the Disabled. I mean, there's, there's sort of an ongoing process of mm -hmm. meeting about issues of snow removal, mm -hmm. another issue that you're probably also very sensitive to is the issue of tree roots right and causing <laughs> heaves and sidewalks yes and, and that's and that's another topic that uh, I, is kind of continually on the table and as they get identified uh, the DPW does uh, uh, try to address them so yes um, there is there is an issue of tree roots and yeah, uh, yeah th yes but I, I'm, I'm not here to complain I'm here to interview no, 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 sure. no. But I, okay. I mean, I, I just, um, I just thought that in in light of your comment, mm -hmm. uh, it would be appropriate to okay. let people know that um, uh, that uh, there are ways to to get these issues addressed, yes. and, and also now with Brook Online, you know, you can take a picture, and and, uh, and you just it, gave me an idea. It goes, you know. You just gave me an idea that. The question was, what what could I develop or commit to? And that is developing a program where people could become aware of ways to uh, address the issues mm -hmm. that they find troubling mm -hmm. for uh, uh, for the um, differently abled. That's okay. great suggestion. Great. Not only differently abled, but women with baby carriages, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Valencia, I, I, um, thank you for applying, and uh, you've told us a lot about your interests. I wonder if you could just fill in a couple blanks first. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about your background, your education, your employment, and what, you know, what, okay. where, you, where your expertise lies. Okay. Um, I'll start at college, of course. Good. Um, I have a four-year degree from Brandeis University. During that time, I worked three jobs to help put myself through college. I had a work study at the college. I was in a state-run internship, and I also developed a babysitting business on my own while I maintained a B average, and I graduated on time. So that that was happening. When I left school, I took some time off after that. I became employed at the Department of Social Services as a fiscal analyst. So I work with all their budgets and in programmatic budgeting. And during that time, I also volunteered with a program called Youth at Risk. And 
it was a program that took, how can I say, <laughs> young criminals, because they had to have less than two um, offenses with the law, usually violent offenses with the law. And it was a mentoring program. So I was in charge of volunteers. My job was to recruit people to do one-on-one -on -one with the youth. And, once, and it only ran for about one year. That was not my fault. And um, we had a two-week camp. And that was staffed by volunteers in which I recruited all the volunteers. I set up the staffing system. I didn't set up the system to run the camp. That was, that was a hired company that did that. But I did recruit all the volunteers. And I kept the volunteers there for two weeks in a rotating system. So that's part of it. Um, I will tell you that I have systemic and central nervous system lupus. And after being diagnosed with systemic and central nervous system lupus, when I could, I set up lupus learning groups, which were different than support groups. They were learning groups in which I had other women, at least seven or eight women, come. And I taught them how to work with their doctors and their families, as well as teach them about the disease. Um, these groups were successful. I also was employed by Actually, I wasn't employed by Harvard Pilgrim Health Plan, but Harvard Pilgrim Health Plan, plan allowed me to run um, a class in, in, within their program, which was to teach people how to, um, how can I say it, move through their system. Because at, oh, excuse me, at the time, people had problems on how to move through HMO systems. So I taught people, basically, when you come in and you see your doctor, who do you, whom do you go see first, how to prepare to see your doctor, that type of thing. And the program was successful for the people that came, only there weren't that many people that signed up. But I would say it was successful because afterward, when Harvard wanted to run their own, the person in charge came to me and asked me for my outlines. So I thought that was pretty successful. Um, after that, I, because I wouldn't stop, I did become sick, you know, worse. And I just took time off. And now I'm at the point where I can reemerge into public life and give it myself again. Great. Thank Great. you. Great. That helps. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And I bet You're you welcome. I bet you that your grade point average <laughs> at Brandeis was without great inflation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually it is with inflation. Some people <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> Never say that. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay, Neil, do you have, I a won't say that. have one more question, I think. Yeah. Um, one of the according to the bylaws that exist now, one of the uh, the goals of the commission is to, and I'll you know, read it, increase communications r across racial lines to destroy stereotypes, mm -hmm. to halt polarization, mm -hmm. end distrust and hostility, yes. and create common ground for efforts mm -hmm. towards public order and social justice. So um, do you have any thoughts on, on that and how the commission can help uh, uh, move us towards, towards that and how it can improve that? I, I have read some of that, and um, I don't want to say anything wrong, no. but my biggest thought, my, my whole thing is action, mm -hmm. and so my biggest thought when I read that was that I would rewrite this to have more words of action in. So I would put, you know, yeah, you do create, but in the creation, what does that mean? you know, what action does creation mean? Um, oh, I, mean, I meant to tell you, I have very little short-term memory, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I usually tape things and write things down. Um, it's, it's really building bridges. Um, 
like I said, Brookline United. And in the way these things happen is really setting up, not forums, but setting up a place where people, in a fun way, mix. Mm -hmm. um, one of the ex, oh, oh, I forgot to tell you. Also while, I'm si while I was sick, I did some private coaching to businesses, um, actually women um, led businesses, and I also, there were, there were people who had children with trust funds, and um, you know, after the children graduated, they didn't want them to just blow their money, so what they did was they hired me to, I hate the word coach because it's so misused now, but basically coached your child, not in finding a job or finding a career, but in discovering what they really wanted to do in life. And I, and I did that with a couple of people. Like I said, I got sick again. And um, one of the young men now has his own business, is happily married, and he's doing quite well. I'm so proud of him. <laughs> um, so, and any other person, he's doing good too. And um, he's sworn to be a bachelor, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but these, you know, it's, it's just that there's like so many little things that just come in and out, in and out, mm -hmm. in and out, that, um, mm -hmm. that I would do. Sort of like I go down and I get back up again, mm -hmm. and I do a little thing and then I'll go down and I get back up again. And no, this is not one of the little things that I'll do when I go down and get back up again. Just so you know. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the exercises I did with the women was I, and these women fought, they were all managers of five different stores. So I got them in a room and I took five different puzzles and I mixed them together <laughs> and I gave them all part of the puzzles and I told them they could not speak to each other, <laughs> but they all had to put together one puzzle and they had to trade the pieces. Now, each person, each group had to first find a leader and a person to put the puzzle together and one to sort the puzzle. So, by the end of it, they were working together as teams. I don't know what they were calling me, but they were working <laughs> together as teams. And don't take my idea. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> but those are the types of things, those are the types of games that I see myself or I see us taking different races, you know, you know, which is a little different than finding somebody that, you know, slept in a sleeping bag, you know, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. It's like it's it's action. It's something but then after that, there's a series of questions that bring awareness to how a person thinks. Like, what names did you come up with for the person that wouldn't trade you for the piece? And they start thinking of all the swears they had in their mind. And, if they, and you say, you see, this is what you call a person when you don't get your way. And, and, and those are the kinds of things. And that's what I like to see have happen. And it may not happen with the whole city, but if we can get a small group, and that small group gets bigger and bigger, and yes, it might start with the teenagers, because children are so powerful in teaching their, children, in their parents. I mean, with Breezy, children know more about service dogs than their parents. So that's what I have to say. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. you Thank very you very much. much. You're welcome. Okay, uh, we're just going to go in the order. The names are printed on our list here. Um, the next is Arthur Conquest. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. And we'll start with the same sort of 
General question, why are you interested in the commission? Um, first of all, um, Arthur Conquest, uh, 115 Tappan Street, Brookline. Uh, I do want to say something before I talk about why I'm interested in joining the commission. Um, <clears throat> I would, I would never, okay, and no one has ever uh, seen me, heard me, be rude, disrespectful, uh, cantankerous. Uh, I just, that's not how I've been raised. Uh, when I say that's not how I've been raised, my mother didn't who's been dead now for about a year, uh, worked too hard to bring her four children into this world to, and bring them along to have them disrespect anybody. And I'm sure if she were alive today and someone told her that I disrespected anybody, she'd get that switch, okay, and let me feel it. Uh, even at my age, it just, it just wouldn't happen. So I just want to uh, make that very clear. I may speak the truth, but I'm not going to disrespect people. Uh, and uh, I hear all these rumors about uh, Arthur Conquest this, Arthur Conquest that, and it just, it's not going to happen. Um, so people may be uncomfortable with what I say, but I was taught to always stand up for what you believe and say what you think is truthful. Tr truth, truthful. Um, second thing. Uh, today, exactly noon time, uh, and I'm telling you about why I want to join the commission, okay, in a roundabout way. Today at noon time, I went. Uh, I was walking to Selectman, Select Woman. Uh, Daly's house. She lives right around the corner from me and up Rawson Path. Each of you, with the exception of uh, Selectman Banker, should have gotten a flyer uh, about... We announced it. Yeah, I know you did. I, no, I, absolutely. But I'm just saying that I personally came and, and gave you a copy of the flyer according to what I was instructed to do by the mob people. And I was walking up Tappan Street uh, from my house at 115, and actually I had I was I had a, a Wayne Short a tune bouncing around in my head, sort of very dizzily walking up the street, and I heard somebody walking behind me, and I turned, I looked, and the, the, it was a white woman, white girl, white high school student, and um, because I was off in another world with my music, uh, I didn't have earphones or radio; it was just my head. I was. That's just, that's just me 90% of the time. I'm listening to Miles or Duke Ellington uh, in my head. And she passed me, and she took a right onto Gardner Road. And to get to Rawson's Pass, I had to take a right to, on, on, on Gardner Road. And she went to the, I think it was the north side of the street. And I walked cat a corner and walked on the north side of the street. And she turned and she looked at me. And I could see this look of fear on her face. And I'm just, you know, I had my running suit on. And she turned again and she looked at me. And I said, nah. And she thir turned the third time. And I said, this can't happen. And she then made an about, about face. And she turned and she walked on the other side of the street. And she walked back down Gardner Road. And I said, Brookline, 2013. I said, maybe I should call the police or something, because nobody would believe that this is happening in 2013. This is, this, this, it's unbelievable that I'm walking down the street and someone thinks that I'm going to, at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, that isn't how we should be living. She should, I feel sorry for her. Uh, uh, it's just, it's sad. And there's a lot of work that has to get done in this town 
in terms of us learning to treat people as human beings. It just, and it, it happens all the time. And I'm wondering how we can go about the business of solving this sickness. It's, it's just, it shouldn't happen. Uh, th th that said, I think that the, I don't think, I know the Human Relations Commission is one of the agencies in town where I think we can begin to make a dent in this problem. Now, Larry Oney, myself, and Rita McNally went to Newton about 10 years ago, and we sat at meeting after meeting and watched them go through a process where they did exercises with the whole town in terms of addressing racism. And they have a, a black mayor now. But we watched the process. Am I right, Larry? We watched the process of them starting out with about 100 people. Maybe there were 70 people in the room. But they worked on it. And they brought in you know, people to guide them in this process. I don't think that the long range goal was to have a mayor. But that's the ultimate outcome. And I'm hoping that at some point that we can do that in Brookline. And the outcome is that we can have some black and brown faces sitting up there where you guys are sitting. Did anybody read the Globe today, the, the metro section? It was a wonderful, interesting story. I, uh, I, I actually brought it along. And it says, mayoral hopefuls confront racism. Did anybody see that? Yep. OK. I think that all you have to do, and I don't mean to, I'm not being rude, I'm not, OK? I'm just stating what's on my mind. I think if you changed the people that were interviewed in the, in the article, the people in Boston, if you changed it to Brooks Ames and Mariella Ames and Arthur Conquest and Cruz Sanabria, you'd get Brookline in that same article. Just, just change the names because a lot of what they were talking about in that article happens and needs to happen right here in Brookline. Anyway, I'm sorry. Next, anybody have a question? Well, I think we're going to try to ask the same questions, at least for fairness. Um, so my question to you is, are you familiar with the bylaw, and are you aware of changes between now and 1970 uh, that would have an impact on the bylaw and the work of the diversity committee? I've been to most of those uh, diversity committees, as Selectman Daly, Selectwoman Daly would uh, attest to. And so I've been watching the process in terms of how uh, uh, that com committee has been looking at the, the bylaws and what they think might have to get changed and how that might affect, maybe it, it might affect who is on the, the uh, commission. OK. Um, other questions from members of the board? Daly? Yeah, uh, um, I, I want to give you a chance to respond to this because you started out by saying how you treat people with respect. Mm -hmm. And I saw an email from you on the Town Meeting Members Association mm -hmm. uh, listserv thing mm -hmm. not too long ago in mm -hmm. which you um, suggested, because you didn't agree with a statement someone had made, that they were more like a house slave than mm -hmm. a field slave. Mm -hmm. Did you think that was being respectful? Sure. I mean, I, when I say that, I was quoting, wait a minute, hold on one second, I, and I'm going to answer that. I was quoting uh, Malcolm X, uh, and I have studied uh, very, very uh, long and hard the system of white supremacy, racism. It's not like I'm speaking without any educated knowledge about how that system works. And I think that, I don't think, I know, the, the greatest stumbling block is 
how the system gets privileged or black people who think that they should or they can get something for themselves if they are compliant, if they are subservient, if they do as they're told and they will be treated differently than any other black person uh, who maybe doesn't have that advantage. There is something called the talented 10th, okay? And they see themselves in the vanguard of the uh, black intelligentsia. And, that, and I've, heard, I've, heard, I've heard black people say, um, you know, if, if we, you're black and you go to Harvard, you should get some sort of special card so that the police won't stop you. I've, I've heard that. I've heard that from educated uh, black people at Harvard. So th that's what I'm talking about when, when I make uh, that, that statement. I, and I know that that kind of relationship still exists in terms of how people, one black is pitted, pitted against another and how one black is treated and others are not. Other questions? No. Yeah, I, I actually do have one question. In your uh, application letter, um, giving some of the reasons, um, you said, uh, I think referring to the diversity subcommittee mm -hmm. of the Human Relations Youth Resources Commission, mm -hmm. that it's your kind of group, and I strongly believe they have the potential. And you talked about them giving up their Saturdays for three-hour meetings and Sundays uh, for four meetings, or I don't know, four meetings or four-hour meetings, mm -hmm. plus their regularly scheduled once-a-month diversity subcommittee meetings, as well as the regular HRYRC meetings. Mm -hmm. What were these su Saturday and Sunday meetings that you were talking about? Um, there was a warrant article that was submitted, I think it was last spring, uh, Articles 9 and 10. It was one by Selectman and one by that diversity group of which I participated. And a lot of planning went into that. Uh, and so many of the members of that diversity committee work. I know Mariella works, uh, Brooks works, uh, Trisha Connors works. And in order for them to meet, they, would, they couldn't do it during the weekday because they have families. And so many of the meetings were held on Saturday or Sundays. Then I have a follow-up, because if it really was a meeting of the Diversity Subcommittee of the Human Relations Commission, mm -hmm. those meetings were illegal and outside the open meeting law, and I don't think you mean to say that. Well, but I'm not a member of that committee, so, I mean, it but wasn't... Those, th th you, you described it as the Diversity Subcommittee. Well, there were, but Trisha's not a member of the, the Diversity Committee, and well, she... Well, somebody convened it, and Fra Frank I don't Fra believe it was a subcommittee meeting. Well, but maybe that was the wrong choice of words, okay? But it, it, I'm going to say there are probably eight people that took part in that, and it wasn't just the diversity oh, subcommittee. It could have been petitioners for a warrant article. Yes. It could have been a group of citizens, but it was definitely, if it was the diversity subcommittee, it was an illegal meeting it, not held under the open meeting law, and I do not believe that was the no, intention. No, okay, so I think you said it right. That the, for It was the petitioners of the warrant article. Okay. Of warrant article uh, 10 at the time. Okay. okay, and I just sort of lightheadedly, lightheartedly said the diversity committee. Do you realize that if you are a member of the commission, you are subject to the open meeting yes. law? Yes, yes. Okay. Other questions? Selectman Wyshynski. Um, I'll ask the same question I asked uh, Ms. Sparrow. Um, one of the goals uh, in accordance with the bylaw is to increase communications across racial lines destroy stereotypes, halt polarization and distrust and hostility, and create common ground uh, for effort towards public order and social justice. So do you have any thoughts on how the commission can do that? Can they, is there, are there things they can do better? Where, where do you see the commission going in that area? Uh, um, I think that that might be one of the, not the, but one of the highest priorities of the commission is to be able to uh, work to increase the interactions, but at a higher level, 
Okay, I mean, I would love to be able to uh, have uh, black, Latino, and Asians uh, interact with the school committee. And I suggested, and I'll send you a proposal that I sent to the school committee to get them to put a MEDCO representative on the school committee. Um, and I think they're actually working uh, uh, towards that. I know that they have a liaison. Um, but to do things like that, to be able to push to maybe get, not maybe, to, to, to see if the town uh, would uh, push to have black, Latino, and Asian um, department heads or heads uh, of many of the, the commissions or the, uh, um, I say commissions, the, the boards um, that we have. I think we've got to be able to elevate uh, black, Latino, and Asian people in the town so that you can, because I think the most important thing is to share power, okay? That's the most important thing. And as it stands right now, and that's one of my uh, pet gripes, that black, Latino, and Asians in Brookline have very little, that's the number one thing. So that's what I mean by cross interracial uh, communications. To, and as we stand right now, there are no, I think there, there might be, there, there are no blacks on the, on the Human Relations Use Resource Commission. Am I right there about that? There used to be. They yeah, resigned. They, 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 okay, they, they aren't now, but I'm All saying. Right, but at this time, but it's because they've resigned, okay, not because there weren't any. Th that's true, but I'm saying let's push uh, to have uh, more black, Latino, and Asians on the commission to re-elect them, reappoint them. Any other questions? No. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mariella Ames. Start with the same general question. Why are we interested in being reappointed? And since you're a sitting member, can you talk about accomplishments that you uh, would like to mention from your experience as a commissioner? Well, I would like to talk about accomplishments. Unfortunately, I should say I have several disappointments. Um, but the biggest one uh, to me in responding to the question of why I'd like to continue to be a member of the commission is to work on First of all, acknowledging the need for the commission and acknowledging uh, the problem from the top. Having a commission that has your backing and a commission whose work is going to be very much supported by, by uh, the selectmen and make, uh, make the work of the commission as well as the support of the selectmen be a model for the community. So the biggest task that I think we yet have to accomplish within the community is acknowledging the problem. And the main problem for, in my view, is, is our lack of diversity, uh, is uh, the, the uh, issues of race relations, complaints of discrimination, um, we can talk about education, and that is part of the, of, of the tasks that the commission has. And we, we have to work on that too. And I'm sorry to say that we, I think that we have tried to educate. Um, we may not have been successful yet. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you the same question I've asked others. How familiar are you with the uh, Commission's bylaw and are you aware of changes since 1970 in regulations and laws that would affect the uh, Commission and the, um, wh how, what do you know about what the work of the Diversity Committee uh, is doing with regard to the bylaw? Let me first respond to uh, my being familiar with the bylaws uh, for the commission. Uh, it is precisely the bylaws of the commission that uh, 
drew me to join the commission. I, I do see the relevance of the, of the bylaws uh, today, as I have stated several times, uh, that despite having 40 years passed, um, it is still very much relevant for precisely the groups that were the, the commission was set up to uh, advocate for to serve, in fact. Uh, I am familiar with other laws, if you uh, specifically refer to the open meeting law. Um, if you uh, ask me about the work of the Board of Selectmen's Committee, Diversity Committee, I am uh, somewhat familiar with the work. Um, uh, I, it is pretty clear to me at this point that uh, whatever their recommendations have yet to be uh, passed and approved by town meeting. I also have um, early on had uh, mentioned that the membership of the diversity committee of the selectmen um, paradoxically did not have any members of the uh, six petitioners of Article 10, which in reality gave genesis to your committee, your diversity committee. And also, it doesn't have a legitimate representation from the commission. So um, in any event, it is clear to me that it has to yet be approved by town meeting. And whatever, are you aware of the subject matter of that commission, of that committee, what it is? What it is about the bylaw, as a commissioner, you do understand the bylaw, you've said that. Yes. So do you also understand what that committee is attempting to do with regard to the bylaw? Well, I would appreciate uh, rather your educating us uh, as to what your committee is doing. As I said earlier, there is no representation uh, from the commission in that committee. So if I, uh, if I am to learn uh, much from it is either by attending or, or by uh, you sharing with us. So um, I, I can tell you what is it that uh, was charged with, which is reviewing the bylaws. Um, it was also charged at some point, uh, was talked about rather, uh, about affirmative action policy. Um, um, <laughs> there are a couple of other items that are there. That I thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Second daily. Yeah, um, our most recent census data showed that the population in Brookline of Asians is up to about 15 percent. Do you right. have any thoughts about how the commission might particularly reach out to that community? How? How? Uh, yes, I'm sure. Uh, I uh, I have several ideas, uh, but again, the first one to me is is to uh, acknowledge that there is a problem. And we have been working on, you, you are very aware, we have been working on what the bylaws suggested, and not suggested, state um, affirmative action, and we got a block on it. Uh, we, we have been trying to work on the uh, complaints of discrimination. Uh, we, we also found ourselves being blocked. Um, yes, I, I know we can reach out to the uh, Asian community. Um, and I, in fact, I believe that the person you uh, hired recently to work uh, for uh, support of the uh, commission um, is um, the chair of the uh, Asian Family Network of Brookline. So right there is somebody that we can work with. and. Move and, forward and thank here. you for acknowledging the selectman's choice of an Asian for that person, that position. Other questions for Ms. Ames? Selectman yes. Goldstein. Thank you. Thank you, Mariella, for uh, seeking reappointment. Um, you spoke a moment ago about uh, your frustration at failing to educate and for, for, or for people to learn, maybe not for your failure to educate, but for learning. And <laughs> yes, can, thank you, you. can you put a sharper point on it for me? Who is it that you feel most needs to learn? Is it, is it the elected officials? Is it the staff members? Is it the town at large? Go, go into that a little deeper. Oh, uh, how, how exactly has that failed? Um, well, I can start with, with um, 
I can start with the top administration. Uh, I, I do feel that the rejection to acknowledging that there are a, there are a lot to learn um, in terms of race relations in our community, uh, not only <coughs> not only within the workforce where I see uh, the decision makers having a key role to play in in trying to make it better and allow for uh, discussions to happen, allow for participation um, of, of community members, employees. Uh. So do, do you think that the administration does not want to see a more diverse workforce or that they are, are not educated about the uh, desirability of that? No, I think that they, uh, they may say, we may say, uh, we are and we embrace diversity, we want diversity, but when, when the time comes to act, then, then the result is not the same. It should be, yes, we want to act, we are going to, to uh, open up avenues to make it better, and to begin with is, is allowing discussions to happen. Um, opening up to new, new ways of doing things, um, trying to make better proposals that are presented, rather than that doesn't work, it is the, it, 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 that belongs to this particular uh, group only. Um, no, you need expertise to deal with this, you are not qualified to, to, to do that. And, there is a lot to learn from, if we have the problem of race relations, there is a lot to learn from those involved in that, whether minority employees, minority members of the community, and it doesn't mean only black or brown, yes, Asians. Uh, everyone has a perspective that not necessarily uh, is the same, but it is different from mainstream white and people of color. Uh, and, and some do have a worse experience. And something that we need a great deal, and I really hope the commission can bring, is trust. Trust for those groups to find a place where they can rely and, and um, have their issues addressed. Thank you. You're welcome. Selectman Wyszynski. Um, you've heard my question. So I guess I'll pose it. Um, the, one of the goals is, um, of the commission is to increase communications along racial lines, it's, uh, to destroy stereotypes, halt polarization and distrust and hostility, et cetera. Um, do you have thoughts on how the commission can improve in that area and uh, uh, areas and thoughts on, um, well, thoughts on how they can do, how, well, how yes. they can do it better. Well, the first, the first step would be for the commission to have a massively diverse membership. Uh, then it would be to look for uh, qualified uh, candidates to, when positions open, open to be considered for uh, appointment, by you, I mean, uh, so, so that uh, we not only, uh, not only do we increase visibly the diversity of our, of our work, uh, workforce, but we also send the message that we are, um, we, we welcome different, pers uh, different perspectives, uh, different people, um, it, is, it is in the modeling and in the seeing where things will then follow. And, and, and you understand me when I say things will follow. Other questions for Ms. Ames? I, I'm sorry, I'll let you, if you have any questions. No, don't think so. I just want to, as I say, uh, thank you for the interview. I, I do want to repeat something that I said um, at some point in the many meetings, 
I, I would not be here if I did not have it clear that uh, there is a need uh, for a commission to exist in Brookline. And, and I do believe that with the recommendations that the, the Selectments Committee uh, may make, I believe that still the need for a commission will be there. Uh, and when I say a need for a commission, I mean specifically the aspect of uh, race relations um, will be there. I thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Vanderzeel. Good evening. And thank you for um, granting me this interview and uh, writing my application to be a member of the Human Relations Youth Resources Commission. I appreciate being able to talk to you. I've been a resident of Brookline for almost 30 years now. My husband and I have raised five children here. Um, they've gone through, four of them have gone through the uh, Brookline Public Schools and I feel I owe a, a debt to this town for the wonderful schools, the safe neighborhoods, the other things that we've enjoyed about this town. Um, I haven't been active in um, many town things uh, until last year and the reason for that is in uh, last year I retired uh, from my position at Harvard Vanguard Medical Associates as an obstetrician and gynecologist. So between that position and raising five children with my husband, little time was left to devote to town activities. As you know, an obstetrician is often up at night and has very peculiar hours. Um, but since retirement last year, I have um, been involved in multiple areas now of volunteership between anywhere from the food pantry here in Brookline to the VU School of Medicine as a volunteer instructor there. Um, and in May of last year, I was elected to town meeting as a um, uh, uh, representative for Precinct 15 and re-elected this past May. And, and oh, I neglected to tell you, my name is Cornelia Vanderzeel. I live at 100 Walcott I think we Road. knew that already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did, okay. So, um, and um, I have uh, looked, I have read the uh, bylaw 3.14 regarding the, the current bylaw, and I understand and have been to the meetings of your uh, committee on diversity, equal opportunity employment, and affirmative action, as well as having attended meetings of the uh, Human Relations Youth Resources Commission, um, some where there was a quorum and some where there was none, so there was no meeting, and also of the diversity subcommittee of that particular um, uh, commission. So um, I come to this with qualifications that are probably very different from most of your applicants by nature of the work that I have done through my life. I mean, you have my, my resume, so you know what I have been involved in. I've had a longstanding passion and interest in the issues of social justice and discrimination. Um, and through my work at uh, Harvard Vanguard and prior to that at Kaiser, I was a member of and sometimes chair of a uh, quality assurance committee. This is the committee that is, does peer review of issues uh, where potential um, problems with quality of medical care are discussed in a protected environment. I've also been uh, chair of the concerns committee at Harvard Vanguard, which is essentially the com patient complaint committee. So I've dealt with those sorts of issues. Um, and am very, very um, aware of the principles of evidence-based medicine. Um, and I would like to use some of that same um, interest in evidence base to address issues that the commission may face. Um, as an OBGYN, I've helped uh, many women and, and their spouses uh, or significant others face some very difficult issues and try to navigate their way through these problems. Um, and so I hope to use all of these skills to address um, some issues of discrimination and injustice that I, I see in this town, which I love dearly. And as I say, I have a, a debt of gratitude to pay to this town. Um, I want Brookline to be a town where all the residents and the employees and visitors 
feel empowered to raise their voices um, uh, for the betterment of all of us. So because of that, I ask that I that you appoint me to this commission. And I am aware of the um, flux that this particular commission may be in, but I think that I can provide a perspective that you will not get from a lot of other people in town to this commission. Um, and in terms of Selectman Wyshynski's question about what I'd like to do. I, You're not going to let us say anything, right? Uh, well, <laughs> I've listened to. Do you, do you want, That's OK. Oh, no, no, no. Wait. Sorry. It's, 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 it's typical, actually. We usually say to the last person being interviewed, we're not going to bother to say anything, because you've heard it all already. Go ahead. Yeah. I, one thing that I have been thinking about, and um, when I went to a meeting a while back, I, I don't remember when it was. It was probably last year sometime of the uh, commission, um, the um, meeting was, was not held in town hall. And I would like to see the commission go out to the community and meet in different meeting places around the town. And not only do that, but, but also publicize this so that people who live in those areas will come. I mean, I can see going to, I live in South Brookline, that's not really considered Brookline by a lot of people. So I'd like to see us meet at Putterham Library, say, one evening on a Monday or Wednesday when they're open. Um, go to some of the public housing, senior housing, um, and, and be sure that people there know that we're there so that they can come forward. I, I would like to see this commission be open to um, uh, concerns that people in this town have um, dealing with issues of... Uh, race and other issues that they may see as unjust. I'm always looking for ways to make things better. So. All right. Are there any other questions for members no, of the board? I think she covered it all. Thank you. you pretty much got it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And now we are going to move to the next item on our agenda, which is to consider an appeal from petitioners under Section 4, Chapter 317, Acts of 1974, as amended, of the vote of the Transportation Board on October 3rd, 2013, to defeat a motion to relocate a new, the new Route 66 bus stop inbound, that is to say, uh, southbound on Harvard Street at Coolidge, uh, Harvard at Coolidge Street, uh, to return it to its original location, which was defeated by a vote of four no to one yes. Uh, we have a petition which has been signed by more than 20 registered voters, which is required under the Act. And pursuant to that Act, by a majority vo vote of the Board of Selectmen, uh, a, a, a majority vote of the Board of Selectmen is required in order to overturn an action of the Transportation Board. So this is a public hearing, and I just want to give everybody some rules because clearly we have a large turnout. Um, we're going to hear first <clears throat> for background a summary of the Transportation Board's deliberations and decision. Um, we'll ask if there's a representative here to speak on behalf of the MBTA. We'll hear from the petitioner, Mr. Rabinowitz. We'll also hear from uh, affected abutters who may not be residents of the town. And we will hear from residents of the town. We will not hear from folks who are here in support but who are not residents of the town. This is a municipal judicial matter. And you may submit comments in writing. We have received some in writing, but you are not going to speak tonight, except as an affected abutter. So moving forward, uh, who is here to speak on behalf of the Brookline Transportation Board? Mr. Safer. Josh Safer, Chairman of the Transportation Board. Uh, so would you like me just to uh, give a little summary of events? Yes, please walk us through the uh, activities, and I really want you to tell us what the action, what led to the action of the Transportation Board, I guess. I think there's several years of history. Exactly. Okay. So the, uh, there was a multi-year process 
to uh, revamp the route of the 66 bus uh, in order to make the uh, route more efficient by streamlining stops, by uh, putting stops into better locations for both safety and for uh, uh, speed. Uh, that, w that went the entire length of the route, but that included a subs the stretch along Harvard Street and Brookline, obviously, as well. There were uh, numerous uh, hearings uh, generally and specifically by our Public Transportation Advisory Committee, PTAC, which was formed in part at that time to take advantage of things like this, and this was the prime example and their, pri one of their primary activity, in fact. Uh, I think we've depending upon how you count, I've heard counts of 20 uh, to 50 public hearings and meetings that went on over several years on this subject. The MBTA held hearings as well. Uh, we on the Transportation Board, with each iteration by PTAC, uh, held our own uh, discussions of, the, of, the, of, the, of those iterations before they transferred them to the MBTA, for example, and then finally the uh, signing off on, on the final proposal. Uh, there was controversy in terms of routes that were removed, and therefore there was much publicity uh, with regard to these meetings, uh, the, so that beyond our public noticing, uh, there was uh, publicity in newspapers, the tab at the Globe specifically. Uh, the final decision uh, for this, um, for the for the streamlining for the moving stops and such, uh, took place in the spring of 2012, and the MBTA then had a specific budget for enacting that proposal with the monies running out in September of 2013. The uh, as uh, uh, the, the process was such that they quick scrambled just over the summer and into September to finish up some of the, uh, some of the specifics there, and that included uh, moving the stop uh, that's in question tonight, uh, the one uh, inbound, inbound towards Boston, that is, or southbound, depending on how you want to think about it, <laughs> um, on Harvard Street. Um, uh, All destinations lead to Boston. I guess really? so. Yeah. Um, uh, Point the on Dudley destination. Right? From, right. from one side of Coolidge, uh, from, the, uh, from the Brighton side of Coolidge, as it were, to the um, Coolidge Corner side of Coolidge Street. Um, the, uh, so and that's, when the, that's when the complaints that are before you began and came to us. Uh, we, heard dis we heard discussion at the next um, Transportation Board meeting that we were able to assemble. The Jewish holidays uh, proved to be a bit of a conflict as well, and so the, uh, the next meeting that was logical uh, was in the beginning of October, and uh, we heard the, the concerns raised by uh, uh, the owner of the boucherie and various supporters uh, and customers and such. Um, the thought process of the Transportation Board at that very late juncture was as follows. With regard to this s specific stop, the notices had been, um, had been significant, the publicity had been significant, the process had been significant, and they had not participated up until that point. The actual, this actual stop was not one of, was, was, was a re relatively modest gain for the entire route. This is not a signalized intersection. It was a relatively small movement from, the, from before the intersection to after the intersection. After the intersection is considered preferred, but it's more important when it's a signalized intersection, and this was not, so it was not highest in, in importance, and uh, the minutes of PTAC clearly reflect that. Um, I, I personally am open to the idea that if there was this much turnout during the process to have kept it where it was, they might have had substantial influence on that. But nonetheless, um, it was moved to the technically correct position. Were we to move it back to the former position, then we would need to reopen an entire additional process where we would have to invite all the other abutters as well who may be happy with the improved position or with the quote unquote new position. Um, we took into account parking as well, 
and the overall streamlining re was relatively parking neutral. Uh, in fact, some stops were taken out, so I think we might have even had a net gain. Um, but, but let's say that we're roughly neutral. Um, so uh, we took into the, to, to account those as well. Bottom line is uh, that we voted four to one, with me being the one actually supporting moving it back. Uh, but my, but my, uh, with my logic only being that it was a relatively modest shift one way versus the other. Uh, but we voted four to one in favor of leaving as, as it is rather than reopening that process for this specific situation. And the thinking was, one, we didn't want to open the process. Uh, the MBT did, MBTA was not inviting us to open up the process for all of the stops in any case. Um, if we were going to start to open up the process, we were already beginning to hear other small um, complaints or suggestions or thoughts for th how people, how other abutters would like things done differently with, uh, with regard to their stops. And we thought that would be um, essentially reopening a multi-year process to no real significant gain. And I guess that's the bottom line for how we voted as we did. Okay. Are there questions for Mr. Safer? Yes. It's like Goldstein. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Josh. Uh, is, was handicapped accessibility also a consideration in redesigning these bus stops? Yes. They were, so they were upgraded uh, for that. There were some shelters, that, uh, uh, there were improvements in shelters in some locations. There were a handful of, of amenities along those lines, yes. So can you explain w what makes a bus stop handicapped, handicapped accessible? What, what are the physical steps that need to be taken? Uh, um, the answer is no. Uh, <laughs> but we do have <laughs> but Mr. Corain. Right Mr. Corain, our transportation administrator. Um, Todd Corain, transportation administrator. One of the driving forces behind the entire projects that the MBTA took on to improve their 10 key bus routes was a Federal Highway Administration ruling that all bus stops had to be made handicap accessible. And what that requires is for them to locate um, an eight foot pad to pour a level landing on the sidewalk that is eight foot that matches up with the handicap entrance to the bus, which is actually the middle entrance to the bus. I see. And does, so, a, does a handicapped accessible bus stop require more space than a, than a, it, it depends, it depends on if it, it depends on where it is located. Um, and what happens and how the street furniture plays out. You have um, parking meters, you know, obviously those don't play into it, but you have benches, you have uh, trash receptacles, you have street lights that might be in the way. But essentially, um, in terms of, if you're referring to the email that um, was distributed by the MBTA, um, what they're referring to is in order to get the bus into the space and pulled into the curb, yeah, those spaces on the near side require more space because they're pulling around cars and then have to maneuver the 45-foot bus so that it is um, parallel flush with the curb. Um, those on the far side require less space because they can actually just pull up directly as they depart the intersection. They just pull right into the spot. They so don't have to maneuver around cars. get that entrance next, the bus entrance next to the path. Exactly. It's easier for them to get right into the curb without having to pull around cars. I see. So more parking spaces would be lost to make that space handicap accessible if it were on the north side of the intersection. Yes, jumping ahead to, to what the MBTA explained in that email um, that was distributed to you. In order to make the um, bus stop handicap accessible there and to allow the, the bus to pull into that area, it would not only need the current 40, what was I believe 44 foot bus stop, it would also take two additional uh, parking meter spaces to allow the bus to pull in and make that maneuver, which is um, Seen actually, if you if you're familiar with the changes that were made, the stop in front of Stedman before Stedman Street um, is actually on the near side because uh, we consolidated two stops, and that is actually a very long bus stop to allow them to make that movement and pull in. Yeah, Joshua, was this a point that was considered by the transportation board as they deliberated on this? At, at this at this juncture, yeah. I, I can't say this was that important. This was a consider these these considerations uh, were for were the considerations for the original plan. So for moving it to the new location, yeah. but for not moving it back to the old location, yeah. uh, we had not really considered that. Now since okay. we since then for what it's worth, 
uh, the um, loss of parking apparently would become even more significant because there would be need for an even larger stop north uh, per, new, per the newer guidelines, that if we actually moved it back, we would end up losing more parking even than we had recognized when we were talking just a few weeks ago. One, one more quick question. Can you describe how notices of meetings are given, what, what, in, in what form they're given? Um, so we, we, send, uh, we, we usually send written notice to abutters, and we always send electronic notice to the entire town meeting listserv. Uh, and then we use the usual town uh, website posting. Um, Do notices to abutters go to the owner of the property or to the tenant or to both? Uh, that is a good question. Um, no, I've said I think Mr. Mr. Corain. Mr. Corain. Yep. Mostly the owner. Um, we actually do both. What we do is we um, mail out to resident at, if it's residential, with the address. And then we do business owner at the address. And then we also go from the, um, the assessor's database to get the owner as well. Um, so those, those notices go out. We also post it on the town calendar one week in advance in compliance with the town meeting um, request, which gets emailed out, I think, to approximately 300 people they have on their email list. And then we also post it on the um, town meeting member listserv as well. Thank you. Okay. Right. Other questions? Selectman yeah. Banker? Todd, Todd as, as I understand it, um, the question of where this bus stop would move to is not before us tonight. Is that correct? I mean, the question is, should the bus stop be in front of the butchery? And you had indicated that there would have, to me, I thought, that there would have to be then another proceeding about whether it should move back to in front of Aborn Hardware or should move somewhere else. My understanding is that this board has the authority to overrule the Transportation Board's decision to move the bus stop there. Because we would be moving it back in front of possibly a born true hardware or another location, we would have to notice those abutters, receive their input, because as Josh alluded to, um, moving it back there has certain limited, you know, removal of parking spaces now on that block that affect those abutters, and it might, it would, I'm sure that they would have an opinion and would want to weigh in on that. Yeah, I mean, I um, just, you know, this, this, letter from the MBTA or email from the MBTA, uh, as I understand it, is not, I mean, th that is a determination that has not been made by the Transportation Board, and that is not something that's before us tonight. Correct. The MBTA could not be here. Um, so what they did is they sent that email um, giving their opinion on explanation why they favored moving it in front of the butchery. and the impact that might be occurring if we move it back to true to um, I, I have, your old location. What's probably a really crazy question, but what if it's just eliminated totally? No bus stop. You would dramatically reduce the level of service for bus riders in that area. Between, but you'd reduce the stops, which I stop, gather was one of the goals of this analysis. Well, it, it, was, it was many different goals. It was to streamline service and to improve service and to make it more regular. And one of the goals of the working group and of the MBTA was to create stops within a certain reasonable distance um, that would attract you know, the, the, the clientele. If you were to eliminate this completely, I believe, and I'm just, I can go back to my notes if you want, but um, from the stop uh, before it to this stop, it is, I believe, over a thousand um, over a thousand feet and then if you were to go from this stop to the next available stop it's about another 700 feet so you would actually be requiring somebody to walk um, a very large distance in order to get to one of those bus stops but again that uh, chairman DeWitt is not something no I just had to for us uh, maybe true but I'm still curious I'm yeah, allowed to ask yeah. the question no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of trying to define the issue yeah. here yeah so, okay, yes, Selectman. So, so perhaps uh, along Selectman Banker's lines, um, when, when, when you say uh, it would be reopening the process, uh, Josh, 
Um, would it be reopening just this process or kind of the whole, the whole plan? Uh, from from well, a couple of things, I guess. From our perspective, only in the in the in these couple of blocks. I, I can't envision how we would reopen. That that that, that to me would be just e extreme, uh, and and the amount of time and effort put in already. Um, to just go back and revisit all of that would, would, would seem quite wasteful. Further, then the second point is the MBTA was very engaged in, in this process and, 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 and supportive and we were very aligned. Uh, so I can't, even though I say we would reopen the process, that's even assuming that the MBTA would sign on. Um, I have a suspicion that because of the controversy on, these, on this specific stop, we probably could have sway uh, but uh, but certainly over the entire right. route, no. W uh, second question is: Would there be a, f a fiscal impact uh, uh, to the town um, if we were to um, uh, overturn the uh, decision of the transportation board? Yes, it would be modest. Uh, we okay. the signs and the meters would all have to be moved um, back essentially on our dime. Basically. On our dime. Yep. Other questions for the Transportation Board? Seeing none, I will formally ask, is there someone present who will represent the MBTA? And I believe the answer to that is no, no one could be here. We did receive an email, um, which for the record, uh, I will read. It says, we recommended the relocation of this bus stop to this location to improve pedestrian safety at an adjacent crosswalk and to reduce the overall loss of parking spaces. Making this bus stop handicap accessible requires that it be lengthened and this takes away parking. The relocation would actually reduce, in other words, putting it in its current site, would reduce the adverse parking impact. Um, but it also says we would be go okay with going back to the near side stop except that it should be clear that nearside stops need more length and the previous one was too short. Therefore, moving back would take out two additional parking spaces in addition to um, using the previous bus stop location. Um, because the town had conducted its own substantial public outreach process, the MBTA held only one public meeting that covered this stop in February of 2011. However, MBTA appeared twice before the TAC to refine our recommendation. Okay. Um, so could I, could I just ask one question? Um, there is a hydrant in front of Aborn Hardware. Um, how many parking spots have been put back in? Uh, How many, we lost how many in front of the butchery? The, the way that the MBTA looked at it is they looked at it by block by block, so both sides of the block. Okay, um, but, but how, many, how many spots in front of the butchery were lost? Three. Three. And how many were gained? In, just on that side of the street. No, no, on, in, in front of Aborn Hardware. Yeah, just on that side of the street, one. One. Yeah. So even if you lost two more, as they say, if that happened, it would be a, a three for three trade off. No, because no, there was a gain on the other side of the street. Correct. A what, gain of two spaces. Right. What, what so happened was, was, right. What, what happened is before the moves on the block that the butchery is on, you had eight parking spaces. Right. You had three across, on the opposite side from the butchery, and then you had five on the butchery side. When you made the movement to put that bus stop there and to move the other bus stop, the outbound bus stop, to the far side, it dropped down to seven uh, parking spaces on that block. No, I, I, I understand. On the Annis Taqueria block, you had a total of nine spaces. You had five on the opposite side, and then you had four on the side in front of Annis Taqueria. So what you're when, talking about on the other side of the street, you're talking about the switch uh, with uh, the, the, the outbound, the, the, correct the outbound, the daily catch, basically. Correct. The the space is taken away in front of the daily catch, and the space is added. Correct. Okay. So how many? Okay, on the 
west side of the street. Um, yep. You've taken away three in front of the butchery, added one, one. in front of Aborn. Correct. On the other side of the street, you have taken how many away in front of the Daily Catch? Four. Four you've taken away in front of the Daily Catch, and how many have you added in front of? Uh, in front of the Citizens Bank, two. In front of the bank, two. Two. So you have from eight to seven, and then I mean, nine dropped to six. You know, that almost, and, and that's on the far side of the intersection going toward Alston, you've taken away four spaces. I mean, it almost, this almost to me says you ought to flip that back also. If on you flip back that, that back, you also will have to eliminate some of the spaces on the near side as well. Yeah, but you've taken, you've taken away four and only added two back on the Alston bound side. Right, the, the way it works right now is you have seven on the butchery block, six on the Anastakaria block. If you were to flip the bus stop from the, Anastak from the butchery back to Anastakaria, the butchery would now have 10 on their side and Anastakaria would have three yeah, on their okay, block. Okay, you're talking about both sides of Correct. the block. I mean, I, Correct. This, this may have to go hand in hand with flipping the stops on the east side of Harvard Street as well. That would have to be referred back to the Transportation Board yeah. because yeah, that action was in April of 2012. As yeah. you were saying, though, I, I, defining the issue, I, I right. don't think that one is really before us. us yeah, no, no, but I mean, I think, <laughs> it's I think, impact. I think sure. you know, this, the, the loss of the spaces in front of the butchery is in front of us, and I think mm -hmm. if that is not upheld, and it goes back that, that they're probably in that block on both sides, there would have to be some rethinking. Okay, I, I just don't want to redo all the work that they have done no, no. already. No, no. <laughs> all right, we ready to move on? Then I'm going to invite the petitioner, Mr. Rabinowitz, to come forward. Yes, we'll invite him, but if you're the lead petitioner, you go first. You got it. He, he will have his time. Stanley Rabinowitz, town meeting member, Precinct 9. I just want to go back into history to the point of knowing this location, I think, more than the Transportation Board do. But again, I want to say one afternoon I was sitting down watching television, minding my own business, and I want to excuse myself in front of all the rabbis here because I should have been learning and reading the Bible. But the point was, while I was sitting down, minding my own business, my wife comes in with a pad of paper and she says, I have signatures that you're running for town meeting. And I said, what? She says, yep, I got all the signatures you're running for town meeting. She went down right away and had photographs made with little cards. On that little card, it said, Stanley, my first name on top, it said, more help for the elderly. All right, so I took that into experience in a way of my life, and I can't figure out how am I gonna help the elderly when a situation comes up when you have a store that not only helps the community, but brings people from everywhere. And he's such a great guy, I can't tell you, because he takes competition on his own to have other people who are in those locations, and some of them are here, and some of them come and give their products to him to sell. The point what I'm trying to bring out is that these people, young people and old people that come to the store, some of them have difficulties in carrying their bundles. Now I heard from the Transportation Board and I hear from some people saying, well, what's the difference? They can cross the street and carry the bundle. But I had an experience I don't know if anyone else had. I came home from the service serving my country as well as a good friend of mine. We belonged to the veterans together. And he crossed the street with his wife. In that same location, he was hit and died. I had another situation where Tom China's across the street, right in that location, walked across the street. What happened? You never believe it. He got struck down and was in the hospital for three, four weeks. After that, thank God, he came out and survived. The other situation was that a woman 
was left off, and this poor man is looking for a parking space. He drives down Harvard Street looking for a, for a, play, for a space. He comes right out in the front and accidentally hits two cars in front, three children in the automobile. If it wasn't for the neighbors and for the storekeepers, these three children would die because the automobile went on fire. So what I am trying to say to you, it's ludicrous to anybody ever thinking of really putting the bus stop in front of a store that does more business than any of the stores in all of Brookline. And so I come to you and plead with you to understand two or three things in my life that went on. And there are many town meeting members, and I don't want to go through all of this because time is valuable, and I know some of the other people want to speak. But my feeling was mostly the town meeting, like I said, I spoke to Precinct 9 alone, and it was 90% said we should do it. And I was fortunate having somebody who has my first name called me and said, Stanley, I want to help. I want to see that sign taken down. And his name is Stanley Spiegel. So I said, well, the Stanleys, you can't win. I don't know. He said, we'll try. <laughs> but anyway, coming back to the main point where I'm trying to bring out that it isn't only where I feel, you know, jeopardizing the elderly. And my feeling was I've been successful in this town and I served this town and gave back. And the things that I was successful was is helping the elderly and that was my main project. I went ahead and was very, very supportive with 100th Center Street which gave many of the people, the elderly, a home to live. I also was very, very able and capable to work along with the senior center which was necessary to help I in Precinct 9. I think we want to talk about the bus stop, please. All right, what I am bringing out, and I go back to the last point on this because I did feel I want to look out for the elderly, and when I talk about the stop, these are the things that I do feel that it's very difficult, very hard, you know, for these elderly people going forward and carrying bundles and now Thanksgiving is coming on, and I feel that we're only thankful to you for whatever help you can give us so they can come home with their turkeys when they can bring their automobiles in the front of the store and load them up with all the groceries and whatever they have. It would be a real thankful Thanksgiving. I thank you all, and I'm sorry if I took too much of your time. Thank you. Um, questions for Mr. Rabinowitz? Yes. Slackman Goldstein. So, Stanley, a couple of things I want to just clarify. There's no loading zone there right now, right? These are parking spaces. Yeah, they took away three three parking spaces were taken so away. Loading zone is around the corner on right. Coolidge. Right. So, but in, in terms of your last statement that people will be able to load their cars, you're just talking about loading their cars in parking spaces. Right. So, so make the connection for me. What is it about those three spaces that is especially the, pe the people come out from the important for the elderly. I mean, do, do, do elderly do elderly people use those spaces more than others, or I imagine elderly people use the bus too, right? Well, the the question is, I see it. That bus stop is completely in the front of that whole area between the three stores. I mean, we well, it's like three stores there, but it's directly in the front. You can't very well go out the back door where you're saying there is the uh, exit uh, or the uh, where you can loading zone. You can't go out through a loading zone. You have to come out through the front. If you come out through the front, then you have to cross the street. If you have to cross the street with heavy bundles and so forth and elderly people, and sometimes I always said to myself when people asked me how old I was, I said 21. I'm telling you now, I'm a senior citizen and I walk across the street and I carry those bundles and believe me, it's not easy. But Stanley, I th if I understand what you're saying, you're saying if those three spaces were restored, those three parking spaces were restored, that the elderly people would use those spaces and wouldn't have to walk. I'm it seems I'm to me there's lots I'm of saying, elderly people who are still going to have to cross streets because yeah, we're talking no, about but three I'm saying, spaces. No, I'm saying this. You can't put words in my mouth that aren't true. Okay. The question comes up is that these people sometimes have to wait until a car pulls out. Once the car pulls out, they come in, but 
the idea was is for the elderly people to have the okay. groceries that's, put right into the car. So that's what I was driving at. So what you're saying to me is that, that a lot of the elderly clientele there actually double park or circle the block until those three spaces are, are, are vacated? Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Well, it's, a lot of, it's much more helpful to have the three spaces because if you don't have three spaces, then you know, you're having more of a chaotic situation at least you have some chaotic. I grant you what you're saying, but the m less problem you have, the better off you are. And it's the least problem uh, of putting up with a, we need more than three parking spaces. I, I, I understand. I just, but don't take away three. I'm just, tr I'm, tr I'm trying to draw the nexus. You mentioned the elderly, the elderly. It's yeah, that's many the times elderly is right. I want to draw the nexus between what those three spaces particularly have to do with the elderly. I understand it's better for the butchery's clients, more three more spaces th next to the building, next to the the uh, storefront, better for for the butchery. I'm not sure I understand how that's particularly an elderly right. issue. Well, I guess the question is, are you arguing that many of the butchery's clients are elderly? and use those spaces? Well, we have quite a number of them. I mean, I, I should have taken maybe some survey, but I do feel uh, being in that store and seeing what goes on, I see quite a few of the elderly people there. In fact, the woman doesn't live here in Brooklyn. We have them from all over. This is a, a business that's helping other businesses, and that's why I'm saying it, it'd be a shame you know, to force a business out. We know Brookline has been top of the field and they've always gone forward in helping businesses to get ahead. In fact, we lost a couple. In fact, there was a Chinese restaurant which also served the Jewish community and had to close because they couldn't continue on their business. We also have another store that so I the, came... Is the butchery going to be out of business if they don't get these spaces back? I'm saying to you that it can release some of the workers there if you don't get the, because I spoke to some of the people that are coming in. I mean, if you and I go down the butchery, maybe we can see a little different. When the MBTA came down and I called them and I said to them, can you come down and see the situation, what's going on here? He came down and he says, Stanley, you're right. We should move the bus stop. When I spoke to our chairman, who's a wonderful guy, you got good people here as well as yourself. And that good person went ahead and he said to me, Stanley, I see what you mean. And he voted for us to move the bus stop. The only thing is I'm asking you and pleading with you in any direction to look at the safety of the elderly and the people that I know from the experience that had many tragedies and we don't need any more. I want to sleep at night and wake up and know in my life that I went ahead and said I did everything I could to look out for the people crossing those streets. You drive your car up and it's much easier. The Thank only thing you. The, the only thing I'm saying the transportation board could do, they could go forward and make it so the meat is a little shorter. They don't have to go through the two hours, but this is up to them. But we can't lose what we have. We need it. It's been there for 50 years. It, if anybody wants to take away bus stops, you know, they would own the business. They never allow it. Any one of you that lived there and owned that business, you would never allow it to happen. I'm just telling you. Thank you, Mr. Rabinovitz. Okay, uh, we now um, have uh, an opportunity for abutting business owners to speak. Mr. Gellerman, please come forward. Hi, uh, I'm Walter Gellerman. I'm, uh, um, one of the owners of uh, the butchery. Uh, I actually have a prepared statement here, and I'm probably going to cover some of the things that we've just uh, finished discussing. In fact, some of the issues you just discussed uh, uh, with Stanley, um, I'm going to cover sort of from my own standpoint. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm just going to go ahead and re uh, read my statement. And if you don't mind, could you leave a copy with our secretary for the record? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, three parking meters were removed from the front of the butchery on Harvard Street and replaced by a bus stop. Uh, it was ex explained to me at the time that uh, this new location at the beginning of the block would be more efficient and safer. Um, and, and that was the reasoning for, for moving the stop. It was moved only about 30 yards in total. Uh, but the tra Transportation Board admitted, as we heard earlier today, 
that it was sort of an ambivalent, uh, it was kind of ambivalent about the move when it, when it made the move, uh, when it initially voted on this issue. It was passed simply because there was no opposition voiced during that meeting. Had I been at this meeting, I would definitely have objected and on, on behalf of myself and probably a number of the other businesses in the area. Three fewer accessible parking spaces at the front of the store is no trivial matter. And, and by the way, as we discussed earlier, these spaces were not re, uh, replaced elsewhere. There's, we mentioned the fact that there's a fire hydrant in front of the hardware store. And for that reason, they weren't able to replace those spots. So there was a net loss of spots. And more important to, to me is the fact that the spots that we lost were right in front of the store, which is very, very important to our ability to do business. Uh, <clears throat> I know and we all know that parking spaces on Harvard Street are, are always a problem. Now take these spaces away and the bad situation becomes much worse. As Stanley mentioned, the elderly, the handicapped, and people with young children are now more likely to have to cross the intersection in order to access the parking spaces. Because, you know, very plainly, there are no spaces in front of us, so anybody who needs to, to find a park, at, at the park nearby is going to have to cross the street now, where before there were at least a number of spaces they could have used right in front of the store. Now, in regard to the assertion that the bus stop location will add to public safety, I believe that the opposite is actually true. Having to cross Harvard Street with bags in hand and kids in tow, and possibly doing so on crutches or in a wheelchair, will definitely not lead to an improvement in safety. And we talked about the meeting that was held by the Transportation Board early in, April, in, in October to review the placement, uh, to review the, the placement of this particular stop. As we, as we noted, the board voted four to one against returning it to its original location. The four who voted against argued that the process which brought about the original decision was ongoing for three years and no objections were voiced in that forum and within that time frame. It was their consensus that Re re reversing this decision at this point in time would somehow constitute an affront to the process which they had recently taken, uh, which had recently taken place. I must tell you that I had no idea that these meetings had been taking place. The morning when I saw the meters being removed was my first exposure to this issue. And I was not the only one in the dock on this matter. In speaking to the owners of Cooper's Bakery, Colbo's uh, Judaica, to True Value Hardware, and to the management of Citizens Bank. These are all businesses within the vicinity of this particular stop. I found that none of them, not even one of them, was informed of, of what was to come. I recently also got access to a compilation from the Transportation Board of all the communications that related to this matter. I'm not sure, I'm not certain that it's 100% inclusive, but nothing that I saw addressed the about us directly and nothing touched specifically on the placement of this particular stop on our section of Harvard Street. The, co the compilation that I saw consi consisted primarily of newspaper articles regarding bus route 66 and the ongoing study to make improvements. The fact is that none of the businesses in this area were aware of this ongoing project, and it, and it appears that there was no direct communication with the butters. This leads me to ask if it was fair to expect us to attend or even to be aware of these board meetings. If the, bis if the placement of this stop is harmful to the well-being of a significant portion of our community, and if it is harmful to a number of its long-established businesses, isn't it reasonable that it, it be returned to its original location? And especially so in light of the admission by the Transportation Board that there was really no overriding need for this move in the first place. Returning this bus stop to its original location has no downside and alleviates a number of issues that are harmful to the interests of a great many in our community. So I ask, please, do what is right. 
do what is best for a large part of our community that utilizes and is dependent on this section of Harvard Street. Thank you. Are there questions? I, yeah, I have a for question. Mr. Gellerman? Yes. Um, Mr. Gellerman, am I correct that your establishment is the only sort of full service kosher grocery store in town now? Yes. So if pe people who are trying to keep a strictly kosher uh, table um, would, would frequent your establishment? That's correct, yes. Okay. Other questions for Mr. Gellerman? Um, has um, the movement of the bus stops affected uh, your ability to uh, get deliveries? It, it, it does to some degree because um, sometimes when we get a delivery with a very, a very large truck and, and Brookline, as you know, it's sometimes difficult to maneuver a large truck around the side streets. Uh, we have a delivery um, um, area on the side of the building we try to get all the trucks there. But on an occasion when a truck cannot make uh, that, those turns around, we sometimes uh, need to make use of the front of the store to, uh, to offload. So s since uh, the bus stop has been moved, how have you handled that? Well, it, uh, on, on the occasions when that's been a necessity, it's actually um, a bit of a dangerous process, but one of us, one of us that works there, as to tra stop traffic on, on Harvard Street and have the truck sort of back into the side street. Other questions for Mr. Kellerman? I, I just have a follow-up question about notifications. Since you heard that there was at least an effort to reach the business owners by mailing to business owner at a certain address, would you have any knowledge at all of receiving such a notice? No, because if I had received that notice, I definitely would have been here. And not just myself, like I said, I've talked to the other business owners in the area. They all tell me the same thing. They had no knowledge of this taking place until they actually saw the meters being moved. So I'm not sure what the reasoning is for us, but that, but that is the fact. I, I mean, I, could I? Yep. I think it's, I mean, I, I certainly, uh, give credence to the statement that notice was sent out. Uh, what I, uh, what I wonder, Todd, is Mr. Corain, does the does the notice basically just say hearing on Route 66 bus stops, or hear, hearing on Route 66 changes? We mail out a copy of the agenda for the transportation board meetings. Most, <clears throat> sorry. Most of those um, were discussion and action on MBTA Route 66 design plan or, or something yeah. along that lines. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's entirely conceivable that that sort of a notice was sent out. And, you know, I mean, you wouldn't say in the notice removal of bus stop in front of uh, 428 Harvard Street or removal of parking spaces in front of 428 Harvard okay, Street. If I see that, I would have known. You know, well, I, I think I, so I, I was a little more concerned about our notice process and whether or not that would reach the destination. That's really yeah, I mean, my I mean, it, concern. I, I believe that it reached the destination. Uh, I just think that it may not have sort of alerted people to what, what was going to happen. And, you know, that's nobody's fault. That's just an observation, and um, and it, it sort of raises the question of how much detail um, we should go. Is it into. an agenda? <laughs> yeah, how right. much detail yeah. is in an agenda? I mean, you know, this this sort of issue arises with zoning notifications, sure. for example. You know, there might be a, a notice that something's going to happen, and and it, um, you know, I, I know that uh, there have been suggestions that when. Um, <coughs> the planning board mails out notifications that there be something on the envelope that says, you know, there's, there's a, a request right. for a, a zoning Some change sort of out, out on the outside, right. You know, right. Open this up. This is important. Right. So, so I, mean, I, I personally believe notice went out. Um, well, I'm pretty sure but, it was mailed. I was really yeah. But I, I think the, the question is, you know, what are we doing to really alert people to what the implications will be? Right. 
Slackman Wyshynski. Um, okay, so talking about implications, um, I'd like to explore if this board were to, and this is, I guess, is a question for Mr. Corain. Don't get too comfortable. <laughs> um, what would be the impact, and the imp what would be the impact if we were to reverse the um, decision of the transportation board? What would that set in motion? Describe the dom dominoes. My understanding is if you were to vote to reverse the decision of the Transportation Board, it only deals with this bus stop. And their <laughs> vote was whether to, their, their vote was a four to one against relocation to the old spot in front of Aborn True Hardware. If you were to overturn that vote, it would mean that the town relocates the bus stop to that location the MBTA would most likely then request an additional removal of two parking spaces, and we would have to have some process at that point to discuss that. Okay. Second Banker. Yeah, I'm kind of sitting here looking at what has happened at this intersection and trying to get a handle on the numbers on, on both sides of the street. And starting from where we started before any changes were made, it looks to me like we lost three spaces in front of the butchery, gained one in front of Aborn Hardware, gained two across the street in front of the bank, and lost four on the northeast corner in front of the Daily Catch. So just in this intersection in this little commercial area we're down four spaces as a result of these changes three of those spaces being in front of the butcher lost in front of the butchery where people are taking out bags and two of those spaces gained in front of a bank where people are not taking out bags unless they're very very wealthy <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or or have no business with them <laughs> so um, and, and looking at what would happen, I mean, I, I'm inclined to um, uh, vote to reverse the decision of the Transportation Board with a recommendation that the Transportation Board can cha consider changes also in light, you know, as, as you've said, you know, this isn't automatically going to go back to where it was. That will open up a new process. I would actually recommend that the board look at changes on the east or northbound side of the street where, you know, you've gained two spaces in front of a bank and lost four spaces in front of the Daily Catch location. Um, and, and the bank has its own parking. Yeah. And, I mean, if you... Even taking the worst case where, uh, as the MBTA has said, we're going to have to lose two spaces from where we were in front of Aborn Hardware, and even assuming that that happens across the street at the bank, you're going to have to lose two spaces, you'd be down four spaces in the intersection from where it was before all of this started, which is the same amount that you're down now, except those spaces would be lost in front of the bank as opposed to in front of the butchery. And to my mind, that, you know, particularly where the, you know, if you went down two spaces in front of the bank across the street. You went down two spaces in front of the bank. And you gained the four you. back in front of the daily catch. So you'd be, you'd be, net, you'd be net loss of two on mm -hmm. the other side. You'd be net loss of two on this side. But the locations, I think, would be far less sensitive locations in terms of uh, the what people are doing, you know, as I said, the, as, and as Chairman DeWitt said, the bank has its parking lot mm -hmm. um, and the bank doesn't have customers who are carrying bags in and out. So that's my two cents as to where I'm thinking we should go. I, but but there, I'm sorry. Well, actually, we did actually want to see if there were any other members of the public who wanted to speak. So I, I in my mind, I have a few more um, possible public comments and then we'll get to our internal debate. Um, first of all, are there any other business abutters present who would like to comment? Okay. Are there any Route 66 bus riders here who would like to comment? 
Sir, please, please, you have to come over to the microphone and just give us your name, identify yourself for the record. My name, my name is David Perlman. I do take the bus, but one thing I would like to see, in a way we have to have the bus stop there, in a way we have to have the parking spaces there because the MBTA has the lie there when they drop off people there and pick them up. That's the lie, the, the lie that they have. The ride. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Oh. And also uh, buses from the different uh, other elderly complexes uh, come down. And so vans you're talking about, small buses, not like the MBTA bus? Yeah, small vans. I yeah. see. Yeah. I'm sorry, please come to the microphone. You, you're, you're. Okay. I, I think David is, uh, is referring to the fact that a lot of these elderly places. I'm, please stop, start over again, into the mic, because this is all being recorded, and otherwise okay. your voice has not been heard. I, I believe that what David is referring to is the fact that there are a lot of people come who, who get, uh, I, could, I think it's called the ride. Yes, they can't come the ride for own. people with disabilities. And, and that, that's correct. And, and people from perhaps elderly houses, housing that have uh, special transportation, they need a place to park in front of the store. It's, it's very useful for them to have something like that, whereas right now they, they, they could not do that. And I think that's what So they they're would, coming to shop at your Correct. It, your it's a way for store. them to get a ride to shop. Otherwise, mm -hmm. okay. there really isn't a convenient place for them to stop. Okay. But is, is that an argument to keep the bus stop in front of the store? Because then the ride can drop off the uh, patrons right in front of the store. If there's parking in front of the store, tip, I would imagine in most instances that parking has cars in it. And where would they? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. You're right. I mean, it, it goes both ways in that, in that regard. Um, but also another, another issue, and uh, one of the customers who's here tonight, uh, she wanted to talk, but she can't talk because she lives in Newton, uh, asked me she's, to just bring up the fact that she does have uh, handicap plates and she, there is no handicap uh, parking in the area. And it would be useful perhaps that one of these spaces or a couple of these spaces, once they're returned, might be designated as such for, for handicap. I don't, want, I don't think you want a couple of them. Maybe one. Not yeah. before us at this time, yeah. but I did see one other bus rider hand out there. My name is Tommy Vitolo. I live at 153 University Road and take the 66 bus from the Brookline Village area to Harvard Square and back. Um, and I'm pleased to say that the ride through Brookline is far more pleasant than the part through Alston, which is, which is much slower. Um, I also sat in on a number of the PTAC meetings and was um, an observer and, as you know me, occasionally a participant um, of the process throughout. Um, th someone mentioned already that there's no benefit to putting the bus stop in the location it is in right now, and that's, of course, absolutely not true. There's, uh, there's a very specific reason to put it where it is, and that is it gets it in front of the crosswalk. So when the bus riders get out of the bus, the ones that are crossing the street are behind the bus, not in front of it. And that means that the bus can let its riders off and go. It doesn't have to wait for the riders it let off to cross in front of it. And so we're talking five seconds, eight seconds, not minutes, certainly, um, but in fact, none of the changes of any of the stops along the route will save minutes. It's seconds here, seconds there, and they add up. There's a lot of bus stops on the route. Um, and I want to point out that, you know, the hardware store doesn't just sell helium balloons. There are heavy packages coming out of that hardware store. A bag of soil is 40 pounds. A bag of Portland cement is 80 pounds. And so for every argument that someone might like to park in front of the butchery because they have something heavy or large, you could make a similar argument that someone would want to park as near to the hardware store as possible. Uh, and more to the point, we move bus stops about every 50 years. That's about the timeline by which we move bus stops around. And so to 
pinpoint the location of a bus stop based on the current location of a particular business. And with all due apologies to the butchery, I hope you're there 50 years from now, but the odds are, in fact, you won't be. You'll probably find a much better location just slightly down the street, bigger, and with a parking lot, and it'll be great. The point is that you don't put a bus stop at a particular location because of the businesses that are near it, simply because the businesses turn over much faster than the location of the bus stop. So you choose the bus stop based on the right location for a bus stop, and you hope that it doesn't have a particularly negative impact on any business. And you also, by the way, try to remember there are positive impacts to having a bus stop near your business too. Not everyone, um, even in Brookline, drives around, and I'm sure we'll get into that in, more in Article 10. Uh, so it is a positive benefit for bus riders. It's a positive benefit for me personally uh, when I'm going from Harvard Square uh, to or from Brookline Village, which is the closest Route 66 bus stop to where I live. And uh, I think it's easy to forget that there's thousands and thousands and thousands of riders of the 66 bus every day who benefit from each of these small changes. And there's maybe two of us in the room now. After all, most of us wouldn't even be allowed to speak since most of the 66 riders don't live in Brookline. We'd be allowed to submit writing, I suppose. Now, I happen to live in Brookline, so I have the, the esteemed privilege of speaking tonight. Um, and maybe I'm speaking for thousands of riders when I say, yeah, it's 10 seconds every time you go through that stop every day. And they add up by thousands of riders. And, you know, we, we talk about uh, a diverse community. Well, I got news for you. Bus riders, if you've ever been squished on a 6 to 6 bus, you'll know bus riders represent a diverse community. And, uh, you know, we'd like good service. So I encourage the Board of Selectmen to consider that there's an awful lot of bus 66 riders who aren't here uh, and that they are important members of our community, many of them. They're either coming or going here. They're shopping in Coolidge Corner. They should be uh, considered as well. And that there is a positive improvement to the riders for its location now as opposed to in front of the hardware store. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, are we heard enough? Well, I think there's a lot of people. I think we should hear from a few other people who wanted to speak. If there are people who are Brookline residents who would like to speak, we'll take a few. All right. N let's let some other people speak first, all right? So over here, I'll... Yeah, I think I'm talking to you, the lady in the red. Ladies first. We <laughs> I don't care whether you're a writer. If you're a Brookline resident, you're welcome to come forward and speak on this subject. Just come around and speak into the microphone. My name is Sylvia Tuckman. I have been a resident of Brookline for 65 years now. I have been buying at the butchery for at least 50 years, I think maybe 54 years. I'm not sure when the butchery opened, but I was one of the first customers. Um, what I'd like to say is that the parking spaces, in, I wasn't even aware of the parking spaces in front of the butchery when I was young. I'm now an elderly person, Stanley. And um, as such, I have discovered that I used to always park on Cool Street. Didn't matter how far back I had to park because I could walk. When you reach a certain point in life, you find that maybe it's a little more difficult. And I used to look for parking spots closer and closer to the store because I do shop weekly. And when I shop, I do have a great number of bundles. And it's as I got older and I needed to have uh, more ease in getting the bundles, I parked closer and closer. I have now found that I need those parking spots in front. I take an 88-year-old sister-in-law of mine shopping weekly. I can drop her off and circle until I can find a close parking spot. I can tell you that it is very frustrating, even trying to park across the street. There are the, the um, walks walk sign, not the walk sign, well, I, when I walk down to the walk sign, um, 
that's fine, but if I, it's easier for me if I can find parking close to Harvard Street, which is very rare, uh, on Coolidge Street. I can, if I do have to cross the street at any point, um, I find that I'm, if I'm carrying bundles even, I find that it's very, very difficult to um, get across because people do not stop necessarily when you're in the crosswalk. So it really is a very scary situation. Aside from that, um, it's, it's, I try to find, when you talk about, I know you questioned why Stanley was referring to elderly people uh, going shopping. During the daytime, when there's a problem parking, then you find more older people who are now retired shopping in the evening is when younger people go shopping. And that's, per, I don't know what it would be anymore, but they don't have, the, they have more empty spots because a lot of the other stores may not have the same type of shopping people. And uh, the bank is closed. Sometimes you're not supposed to use the, the, the bank, but some people might and, uh, you know, and, and go there in desperation. So it's, um, and that's even people who can cross. In, in the street to get to the other side. Should you find a spot across, then it's difficult, but you do get across. But when you're older, you do need to find the spots. And I was able to find them until recently, until they, I was out of the country, I came back. Shopping from that point on ha has been just a, a not, a, not a, a fun situation. It's been very difficult. So that's Thank you. my two cents. Mr. Kane. Good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Kleckner, Ms. Parks. Uh, Brian Kane for Lincoln Road, uh, town meeting member, Precinct 6. Uh, what else do I got to say? Um, I'm an employee of the MBTA, but I'm not speaking for the MBTA tonight. Um, I'm a former member of the Transportation Board. I am a uh, former, it's former liaison to the Public Transportation Advisory Committee, and I led the Route 66 improvement process on behalf of the town uh, in my capacity as a member of the Transportation Board. That process began four years ago, and we met, in, I met on this topic in, in on serving on various committees and boards uh, for over three years. Um, we did what I thought was one of the most open and transparent processes this town has ever seen. And I guess I was wrong. And I, I do regret that, uh, th that we've come to this point. Um, when I started this process, I literally walked up and down Harvard Street. I talked to the Chamber of Commerce. They signed off on our plan. I talked to the Coolidge Corner Merchants Association. They signed off on our plan. I met with the administrator at the KI Temple. I met with numerous other religious leaders, uh, St. Mary's Church being one of them. Um, but I guess I, I, I missed the butchery. I, I just missed it. And, um, you know, shame on me, I guess. Um, be it, but be that as it may, I, I hasten to add that in addition to that shoe leather, we had over 50 public meetings. If you count the ones the T did on the 66 itself, if you count the ones the Transportation Board had, if you count the ones PTAC had, and if you count the ones the Route 66 Working Group had, all duly noticed, all minutes kept, all public record, all, we, we checked all the boxes. In addition, we had seven public hearings, seven public hearings on this topic. Um, very little controversy except the few circumstances. This one never came up. Um, I, I hear what you're saying on the fact that the, the tenant or the, the, the property owner or the, the occupant was, was notified and, and probably didn't read the letter or, or didn't understand it, and I, I, I'm with you. But, I, you know, I, as, as a person who tries to make positive change in this town, I, I'm, I'm asking you, I, and I don't think it's fair that you now punish me because a failed process might have taken place when I hit all of the targets on that process. I did everything right on the standards and the process as it existed at the time. And to hear you now say that we have to go back and redo that process, maybe we do. But I did everything that was expected of me, and then some. And to now be here tonight, to hear you say that that process may have been flawed. Well, maybe it was, but it was what it was, and I hit all of the standards. And I did everything right, in my opinion. 
maybe, uh, maybe people disagree with me. But if that's not enough, if that's not enough, and maybe it's not enough, I would ask you tonight, if you do vote to overturn this decision, tell me what else I have to do. Tell everyone who wants to make positive change in this town what else they have to do. Is it 51 public meetings? Is it eight public hearings? Do we have to get in the Herald as well as the Globe? The Patch as well as the Tab? What are the standards that we have to hit to make positive change if this isn't enough? Um, I also ask, uh, I, I, I'd like to, to go back to the, to the notion of the, the way that this all happened, the timeline. April 2012, the Transportation Board took a vote to authorize these actions to occur. The MBTA then, as I understand it, and again, I'm not speaking for the T, but I have had conversations with the people in charge of that, took that authorization as a done deal. They waited the 60 to 90 days as required in the Transportation Board's enabling legislation before taking any action. Once that cooling off period and appeals process was exhausted, they began their own process to go through this again. So the vote was taken in April of 2012. I would suggest that, that you, know, you check with town council tonight if this hearing is even valid. The opportunity for the proponents tonight to go through this process was from April to July of 2012. We're now in November of 2013. I would suggest to you that this is not even a valid hearing. I would suggest to you that the Transportation Board's hearing last month was in fact also invalid. That the board held the hearing because it's what the board does. They listen to the town citizens and it's probably the right thing to do. But if we're talking about the validity and the, sac and the, and the sanctity of the process, I would ask you to please go back with town council and make sure that this is even a valid hearing tonight. If you vote tonight to overturn this thing, if, you're, if, if, we're able, if, if, you're, if it is a valid action being taken, and if, you, and if that is decided and you decide to go forward, let's be very clear about what will happen. The town of Brookline will have to go through a, a new public process to move the stop from where it is currently. Because as far as I would suggest the public authorities are concerned, the stop's location is the new location. We can't go back. To go back would require a full-blown public process on that, probably involve um, the town's traffic calming policy, which you adopted recently, probably require a committee of seven or a DAT or whatever, whatever is called for in the, in, the, in, the, in the policy. I forget right now. But it would not be quick. In the meantime, you would also have to have the MBTA come out and make sure that the new stop meets ADA requirements for eight feet, for, and for flatness. We don't know if that exists right now. We do know that the current location meets ADA requirements. We don't know if the, if the stop you, if the location you choose to move back to does or any other stop does. And it would take a full blown process, process for which I hasten to add no budget exists in the town or at the MBTA. Um, I'd like to discuss briefly the notion of, of what I call the, the three magic parking spaces in front of the butchery. The, these parking spaces that are always available when a little old lady drives down her Buickle Sabre and can't see over the steering wheel. Uh, always available, always readily available parking. It is... Thank you. They would have you believe that there's always these three parking spaces available whenever they have to pull up to the, in front of the butchery. Now, you people have driven up and down Harvard Street probably more than I have. You know that this is not the case. You know that that is always parked up. So the notion that there is always readily available parking must be discounted, I would suggest, to a large extent, because we know that that is just simply not the case. We know that people have to park elsewhere and will have to carry bundles some distance to their car. I also hasten to add that there are six other magic parking spaces available on that block now. So finally, on the 66 itself, I mean, look, at it, it's a bus. No one likes the bus. It's the Rodney Dangerfield of public transportation. We know that. We also know that it is the busiest route that the MBTA has. It carries 14,567 people a day. It has currently the lowest on-time performance in the system, but we know it is getting better. Last month was the highest OTP we've seen in seven years. Now, it's been a month, and we can't say that it's because of this process or not, and it's certainly not because of this move, but we know it's getting better, and we know we want to keep it getting better. We also know that the demographics of bus riders are, tend to be people who are not as wealthy as many of us here tonight, who are of a different socioeconomic and racial class than some of us. So we know that there are options that these people also deserve free and readily available public transportation. Um, the, 
the <laughs> I, 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 I'm almost hesitant to, bring, hesitate to bring this up, but the bus stop right now, no, I'm gonna keep talking. The Please bus conclude. Stop, we, we, Jesse, get Mr. Kane, we really do need to hear from others. Okay, I beg your pardon. The bus stop now will allow the ride to pull up directly in front of the store. The ride is allowed to use the bus stop. And the bus stop location currently will allow people with bundles to put it in their car if they stop very quickly. And although I'm not supporting that, it might make it a little easier for people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'm going to take, let's see, you in the second row in the plaid shirt, wait a minute, in front, <laughs> you, <laughs> sorry, I see two other sets of hands, right behind you, second person, and then back in the back, yes, you with your hand up. If you three would come over here, line up, and we'll be glad to hear from you. I think that will conclude. Sir? Yes, and please keep your comments brief if you can. I will work to keep my comments briefer than the previous speakers. Okay, and just my identify name is yourself. David yeah. Pomeranz. I live at 99 Mason Terrace in Brookline. Um, I may need to approach a couple of the um, name placards so I can direct my comments to specific because there were questions and issues that were raised. I'm glad that uh, Mr. Kane is here this evening um, because, um, as the author of the MBTA working group, I'd requested in uh, the October meeting of the a transportation board a copy of this report. I have finally received a copy of it this evening. Um, I've had an opportunity to peruse it quickly, but what was, I think, most interesting to me was the testimony that Mr. Kane gave privately to me a month ago and gave publicly here to you tonight that during the course of his um, shoe leather efforts, the one Jewish location that he happened to have contact with was the administrator at Keilat Israel. And one of the things I think that one would find is that the butchery draws its clientele from a significant uh, part of Brookline, and not just Brookline, but also other areas. Now, Mr. Forgive me for approaching that. That the word? Mr. Goldstein. Goldstein, thank you. Um, Mr. Goldstein raised the issue of senior citizenship. It turns out that the Young Israel of Brookline, which is located at 62 Green Street, is in the process of um, changing. Our, our rabbi is uh, approaching the end of his tenure, and we're in the process of um, hiring our next rabbi. And one of the individuals behind me, um, David Zimbel, is one of the leaders in that effort. And as part of that effort, uh, there's been a survey of the membership. And as part of that survey, they talk about what the uh, demographic, socio-demographics are. So if the selectmen are interested in finding out, as an example of Young Israel um, membership, which um, are significant shoppers at uh, the butchery, then I would suggest you look to the survey results. And I believe just one statistic alone, the average age of the Young Israel membership, and we're the long, largest um, Orthodox synagogue in New England, 300 members or so, is 50 years of age. But you, you can get the age brackets from, from that particular survey. Now, Mr. I'm Mr. Benka. 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 He's Benka. Um, raised the issue of spaces, which I'm glad he is. As we speak, my 22-year-old is teaching or tutoring my 16-year-old uh, in philosophy and math. And one of the principles are um, a sp uh, you know, s things which appear to be identical may not necessarily be identical. Um, a parking space may or may not be equal to another parking space. And I would respectfully submit to the, one of the individuals who testified on behalf of the Route 66 um, bus route that Avorn um, hardware has packages as well. Um, but I would submit that the number of clientele the foot traffic per square foot of the individuals who use the butchery is going to be much higher than you'll find in Avon hardware if one is to do a survey of their square footage. And then the final um, point I'd like to make, and I think this was the same individual who made the point, had to do with longevity of the stores and the uh, bus stops um, only um, changed once every 50 years, and I was, 
curious to ask uh, Mr. Gellerman, and I'll just report to you what he says to me. How long has the butchery been at its current location, please? Just about that, 50 years. About 50 years. And at some point, of course, it would be useful to find out how long Aborn Hardware has been at its location. Thanks for listening to my testimony. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ron Scharf. I'm a Brooklyn resident. Um, I'll try and be brief. There are two things that I heard here that, that are sort of sticking with me. Uh, the arguments in favor of the Transportation Board sticking to where it was seemed to fall into we gave adequate notice, though the description of that notice was very vague. I heard it said multiple times. I never heard what was the notice. I think Selectman Benka very incisively uh, intuited that the notice was probably too vague for the affected people to know what was going on because, you know, this is what a legal axiom recipes a loquitur, the thing speaks for itself. When the people found out, they showed up. Um, and I think that it's not fair to stand on that notice when we see what happened, when people actually noticed what happened. And the other thing that I've heard, you know, the Transportation Board, which actually I find very disappointing, seems very vested in the fact that the thing is done. That's not good enough, right? When you see that people who are affected care enough to come out on an evening and speak their mind, if the thing is done, but it wasn't done right, maybe the thing should be redone. And what I heard is the worst thing that's going to happen if this board overturns what the Transportation Board did is there will be another process. And if that process adequately notices the affected abutters, like Aborn Hardware, perhaps this room will be filled with another group of people who frequent that establishment, and they will speak their mind, and we can have a real process from the people who are affected, and maybe the result will be that the bus stop stays where it is, but we'll have a real process, and we'll have a good outcome, and it won't just be because we did the work, and I, with all due respect to the Transportation Board, they clearly did a lot of work, but I think even the gentleman who spoke, who said he was you know, ahead of that, who seemed to be taking this very personally, it's not personal, Right? But when he said, maybe I didn't do it right, maybe you didn't. Right? So let's be, you know, this is a, it's a, it's a wonderful town full of people who care. Right? And many of them are here today. And many of them will probably show up if we reopen the process. They care. Let them come. Let's find out what the real outcome should be. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is David Zimbal. I live... Um, the corner of Kent and Longwood here in Brookline. And I think the, uh, the key question has been raised both by yourself and even by Mr. Kane, who said, you know, what should I have done? What notice should I have given? What is the right standard of notice? So I brought with me tonight, um, it's a plain English attorney general's guide to the open meeting law. And it says what the notice is supposed to be. It says meeting notices must be posted in a legible, easily understandable format, contain the date, time, and place of the meeting. And then it goes on to say, and list all the topics that the chair reasonably anticipates 24 hours in advance will be discussed at the meeting. The list of topics must be sufficiently specific to reasonably inform the public of the issues to be discussed at the meeting. Reasonably specific. Now, I've looked at all the agendas for all the meetings that Mr. Kane held, and they were extensive meetings, and I applaud the efforts of the Transportation Board and the various subcommittees that, that put an enormous amount of effort into this. But part and parcel of having technical professionals run your meetings and set your agendas is that they speak in code. So instead of simply saying, we're going to have a meeting to talk about moving parking spaces on Harvard Street, they say we're having a meeting to compare the CPTS proposed by the MBTA to the PTAC agenda items of last month. And I submit to normal working lay people, that is a meaningless notice. So the question isn't whether this meeting is legally valid. The question is whether any of the meetings that they held meets the standard of notice under the open meeting law and are legally valid meetings that they held 51 meetings without giving adequate notice. I don't know whether they sent actual notice to the butchery or to the other establishments. None of them recall getting it. I'm a little surprised that the town doesn't have proof of mailing. Um, most people would have that. 
Mr. Cain said, I don't think I should be punished for, for, um, because I did everything right. Well, I, I don't think he did everything right. He didn't give effective notice. No one is punishing Mr. Cain. The people that are being punished here are the owners of the butchery and the people that are in this room that use the butchery. They didn't get an opportunity to speak at a meeting because they weren't given a fair chance to be heard because they didn't have any clue what was going on. I'm not suggesting for a minute that that was deliberate. I'm just saying that is the fact. So I would just like to mention two other things apart from the process. So I mean, I think quite clearly at the meeting we had in October, the, every single one of the voting members of the panel said, I'm voting to protect the process. I'm voting to protect the process, with the exception of the chairman who voted on our side. I would submit to you that the protecting the process means you have to reverse because the process was broken from the beginning. It wasn't done properly. Now, ma'am, you mentioned could you just eliminate that bus stop? And um, I know we're not here to talk about other routes or other stops other than the one in front of the butchery, but I'd like to give you guys, a these are all the same photographs. This is the immediate preceding stop in front of the restaurant. I want to draw your attention to something that I think is called a knuckle. It's this protrusion that sticks out from the sidewalk, you see? So when the bus, this is the new bus stop in front of Rubens. So when the bus pulls in, it cannot be parallel to the curb. It's just high school math. You can't take a large bus, have it parallel because it it would have to drive over the sidewalk to do that. So what happens is it sticks out. Now, you asked about handicap access. When that bus sticks out, the middle of the bus is now five feet from the curb. The handicapped people cannot access that bus properly. They, they dip into this, um, off the sidewalk into the street and then back up onto the bus, which makes it very difficult for people to get on and off that. Now, why do I raise that tonight? This is not the issue tonight. I understand that. I raise it for two reasons. One, I don't think this was a well thought out process from just a practical point of view. And number two, the obvious solution is to move this stop to the other side of, uh, what's the street there, Kenwood Street, and then it, where there is no retail establishment whatsoever, plenty of length for the bus to pull in perfectly parallel to the curb. And then that's, by moving that stop a little bit closer to the stop that's in front of the the butchery, you could eliminate the butchery stop and you'd still be within three-tenths of a mile of the, of the next stop in front of, um, or, or put the stop back in front of KI and you'd be less than a quarter of a mile away. So there's lots of things that could be done differently. I know this is not the forum to plan out the Route 66 bus route, but there's lots of things that could be done if someone took the time and trouble to do it. Um, and the last thing I would say is we, we, we heard from the gentleman who rides the 66 bus how, uh, how many riders there are and, and all that stuff. There's also a study by the MBTA that shows that very few of those riders get off in Brookline. People, pe the, st the MBTA study says that roughly 10% of the riders get off in Brookline. They are really taking the, most of the riders, most of the 14,700 riders in the 2009 MBTA study, use it as a, as a way to get from one side of town to the other side of town. And it's not, it's not, economically s s significant to Brookline for shopping. It's not, I mean, there's many reasons to be a good neighbor and to be supportive of the Route 66 bus, but the problems with that bus are not Brookline's problems. The problem with the bus, as the gentleman said, lie in Alston, where um, the route is, is incredibly badly designed. And I don't see Alston doing as much to fix the route as we're doing to fix the route. So, as I said, I think the process argues for reversing the decision that was made by the Transportation Board in October. I don't think that fair notice was given to, to the owners of the butchery or to the people in the room. And I respectfully request that you um, fix the problem by sending it back to be redone. Thank you. Okay. There's one more hand up. I, I don't know if you want to. Sure, if you'd like to speak, come forward. You're gonna be the last person. I'm Abby Swain. I'm current uh, chair of PTAC, and I was quite involved throughout this whole process, which we've heard a lot about. Just want to make a few um, clarifying points that may help you. 
Um, one is that the Route 66 planning process was never intended to be a zero-sum game as far as parking goes. We knew we'd have to look at some sacrifices due to modern standards for accessibility, um, bus stop length and that sort of thing. So it's regrettable to lose any parking spaces whatsoever, but we did try time and time again to minimize those and to focus losses in places where they didn't matter quite as much. Um, I do want to point out the existence of the Fuller Street public lot, which is just around the corner um, from this particular shop um, and other shops in the area. I did a little reconnaissance when I was on furlough, I'm a federal employee, on October 11th, which was a Friday at 10.30 in the morning. I counted 12 uh, spaces free at that hour on that day, um, which would have been available to anyone um, in front of the newly established um, bus stop in front of the butchery. There was one um, illegally parked Mercedes with its alarm going off for quite a while and an armored car idling. Um, in terms of um, reopening the process, I'll just point out as a volunteer committee member that process costs in terms of um, time for volunteers. We're not uh, most of us professionals, although we do get professional advice from Todd. And so the prospect of reopening this and rehashing it is quite punishing in the time sense, in addition to in the emotional sense that I think you heard from Brian. So thank you very much. Thank you. OK. Can I have a, a minute? I don't think so. Yes, and I just want to pass in what I have all these petitions. Sure. Please hand them. I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of petitions of people signing all these papers. Thank you. OK. Great. Thank you very much. Selectman Daly? Yeah, I, I, I first want to say that I know that the committee, Mr. Kane, Abby, and others, uh, and the Transportation Board put in a lot of tremendous hard work on this, and I, and I do appreciate that work, and this is not intended as, as any um, slight of, of any, any of those uh, members. But I, I think we do have, I mean, this is a, this is a grocery store. They, they're located in an area of town in which many of the neighbors are of the Orthodox community. And so that the, the saying, well, they could go find a better location with more parking, well, yes, maybe they could. But this is, this is they are trying to be located in the heart of, of the sort of Orthodox community in Brookline. And um, I, I drive by there frequently, and I, I do see older people using it. I also see a lot of uh, mothers with tr juggling, you know, the, the, the kid in the stroller and another kid they're holding on to or, or two or three of them. And um, I think that, that asking, it's, it seems to me there is, there is a slight improvement in time by, to, for the bus to have that stop in front of the butchery instead of prior to that intersection. But um, given that it's not a signaled intersection, there's no street light there, um, to uh, the, that benefit of, ha of uh, having moved it is sort of small compared with the inconvenience of a lot of people carrying uh, a lot of heavy groceries and, and looking um, to, uh, to ask the people carrying all the heavy groceries to have to cross the street um, to, to spare the, the, the people on the bus of having to, cr to cross the street. I don't know. It's, it's a trade-off. I, I, I am going to vote in favor, of the, in favor of the neighborhoods of the Orthodox community and um, move. I'm not going to redo all the stops. There, there's actually a draft motion, so why don't okay. you hold off? It's premature. Okay. Other comments? Yes, Selectman Goldstein. Thank you. Uh, I, I have a, a different outlook on it. Uh, first, I, I want to say that as far as the notice argument goes, let's put that to bed right here because this meeting was noticed as the last speaker uh, described. It was a great turnout tonight and there's been a great opportunity and a lively discussion to, to discuss not the process but the actual merits of the, of the location of this bus stop. And my decision and or my opinion on this is based on those merits, not on upholding the process as it's gone on to date. The uh, loss of three parking spaces in front of the butchery is, of course, not ideal for the butchery, not ideal for any merchant to lose three spaces in front of their building. But in my personal judgment, 
it's not as bad as all that. Um, the spaces were not set aside for the butchery. Selectman Daly says that this is going to result in a lot of people carrying heavy, heavy grocery bags to their cars, but I, I, I disagree. There were three parking spaces there. They were used from time to time by patrons of the grocery and put, 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 at time to time by patrons of other establishments. And the, the patrons of the grocery who got there by car parked in many of the other spaces that were, that were nearby and available. So I, I don't think that the loss of those three spaces can be pointed to and say it's responsible for a lot of people having to carry uh, grocery, uh, heavy grocery bags. Um, as I said, every, every merchant in, in, in would, would, would prefer to have the, the street outside of their establishment ideal for their own. And unfortunately, it just doesn't work that way. We have to make compromises. We have to make decisions that are, that are for the great, greater good. I would argue that, in fact, the putting the, the bus stop in front of the grocery might actually have some benefits for, to the grocery. And we heard mention of those at, at various points tonight. There is the opportunity for people doing a quick load, a quick pull over to the curb uh, to, 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 to take advantage of, the, of that. And, uh, and we all know that people do that in, in, in bus stops when there's not a bus there. And also the availability for the ride and for, for other handicap drop off also increases the, the, the utility of that for, for, for the greater good. The efficiency issue is uh, admittedly minor, the, the, the time savings, and I understand the argument that was made that, you know, if this discussion had happened months ago, the, the, this might not have been a place with that, that had been approved purely on efficiency grounds, because I think the seven seconds is something that, that, uh, that we probably could have, could have uh, done without. I think the most important issue, though, is safety, and I'll tell you why. So you ever see a school bus when it pulls over, and you see the stop sign that comes out, and, it, and, it's, and you're supposed to stop and not, to not drive past it? Well, that's one of the most common ways that pedestrian accidents occur, is people getting off of buses and, and, and drivers coming around buses who can't see past the corner, and that's how pedestrians get, get, get injured. And it happens despite the fact that the law prohibits it, that cars are supposed to stop, but they don't. It is far safer and measurably safer for pedestrians to get out and have their, and, and, and walk to the back of the bus and walk behind the bus to the crosswalk rather than where the bus stop was and they have the tendency be to walk forward to the crosswalk and then walk out potentially into traffic. I think safety is a huge issue here. I don't think that the, there's any countervailing safety issue uh, regardless of the fact that, that, that some people might have to, some more trips across Harvard Street might occur. I don't think it measures to the safety issue uh, involved in safe departure from a park, from a, 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 uh, a bus and then accessing the cro crosswalk right afterwards. So my vote is going to be to, uh, to uh, uphold the, the Transportation Board's decision on it. Thank you. Selectman Banker? Yeah, I uh, reach a different conclusion, as I've already indicated. Um, I think, uh, first of all, that the idea of uh, there being some advantage in having the uh, bus stop in front of the butchery so that somebody can pull over and quickly load uh, is really inconsistent with how people shop. I mean, it, you, if you're... Um, if you've driven your car to shop at a store, you have to shop. And, you, and in order to shop, you have to park in some place, then you shop, then you bring your bags out. I mean, that concept of a quick pullover might work very well if there are two people and somebody is circling the block while somebody is shopping inside. But the uh, idea of uh, uh, having a place where you cannot park uh, as somehow advantageous as, a place, as opposed to a place where you can park, go in and shop, and come out with your bags is not persuasive to me. Uh, with regard to the safety issue, uh, I'm sorry that I don't uh, have it. Uh, I had it loaded onto the town's computer and was going to be able to put it up on the screen, but the uh, prior 
um, bus stop uh, in front of Aborn Hardware was at least eight feet away from the crosswalk, give or take. Um, there was a, a significant gap between the front of that bus stop and the crosswalk where people might cross. So this would not be a case, uh, even if the bus stop were relocated where it was, which is an open question, this would not be a case of people walking out immediately in front of the bus into traffic. There was a significant gap between the um, southern end of the bus stop and the beginning of the crosswalk. Um, I also, as I've indicated, have um, some concerns about what has happened in this entire uh, commercial area. And um, that actually was highlighted to me uh, by a member of the Commission for the Disabled um, who sent me an email about the loss of the parking spaces in front of the Daily Catch on the other side of the street. And I forwarded that email uh, to, to Mr. Corain. Um, you know, this, this whole process, as I indicated earlier, um, resulted in the loss of spaces in front of the butchery and in front of the Daily Catch and that block of stores where there would, I think, be um, a lot of need for parking and it resulted in the gain of parking spaces in front of a bank that has its own parking lot. So, um, as you know, it's, it's not before us right now, but um, I would uh, vote to reverse the decision uh, of the planning board, or of the transportation board rather, on October 3rd to maintain the Route 66 bus stop at 428 Harvard Street. And I'd really offer the recommendation that the transportation board also consider the changes to stops on the east or the northbound side of Harvard Street. And I know that that's not before us right now, but that is, um, that is uh, my suggestion. I think um, you, can't, um, you, know, you can't say that, uh, that uh, parking has to be a zero-sum game, but I think it's critical that we look at the impacts on parking when we make these sorts of changes. And um, I don't feel that that was given um, the consideration it should have been given in this case. Um, and let me just add one final comment. Nobody is punishing anybody or criticizing anybody. Um, I think what we were trying to do was to rationalize how um, individuals in good faith on both sides could say, on the one hand, notice was given, and also, I think in good faith, on the other side, say, I didn't know what was going to happen. And, um, and I think there is an explanation for that. Um, but it's not a matter of uh, uh, punishing or blaming uh, or criticizing. It's just an observation of how that might have happened. Slackman Wyshynski. Um, I've actually kind of gone back and forth. Um, um, I think the Transportation Board uh, and the PTAC uh, did a phenomenal job examining the route from one end of town to the other. And uh, we're only talking about one aspect of it. Um, I, I think um, you know, the, the, there are. Um, I, I, I think I'm. I'm I, I think the, the easy vote for me would be to vote to to. Uh, to vote with the uh, selectman Benka, given the, uh, the the attendance in the room, but I think uh, in the in 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 total, I'm I'm going to agree with the uh, selectman uh, Goldstein. Um, I th I think you need to look at the ho the whole plan, and and I thought the plan was very carefully thought out, and um, um, and 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 we're we're opening a, a a bit of a can of worms. It's 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 not so simple. Just to, to we, we, we it, it, it's going to be a bit of a process by which the stop is going to go back, and there's no guarantee that the stop is is, is going to go back. And um, I'm I'm inclined to uh, agree with Selectman Goldstein on this. Okay. Well, sounds like um, the chair's going to break the tie. 
So. Um, actually, I'm um, supporting Selectman Banka and Selectman Daly for different reasons, frankly, um, but I, I have my own. I reviewed the um, recommendations of the um, MBTA working group, and I discovered that there is no mention of the Coolidge Street stop in their report. It only came up subsequently um, when the T brought in its 30% design recommendation. And it's not clear to me that at that point in time, that intersection was given very serious consideration by any of the endless public process that took place. So I am, in fact, accepting the notion that the notifications might not have had clear information in them that people who would be affected by this stop change could understand and therefore realize what the impact might be. And so I am saying that I, there's very clear that it was a thoughtful and thorough process, but I do believe it had a flaw. And I will therefore recommend that we overturn the vote of the Transportation Board, but with the not recommendation, but the direction which we as the Board of Selectmen have, which is to not allow any further decisions about the location of bus stops in this area to be done without full public participation of those people most affected by it. And it seems to me that um, maybe handing a flyer with a very clear, dumb message come to this meeting if you care about what happens in front of your property, would have at least alerted folks to the uh, magnitude from their perspective of what this change might have meant. And it's very clear to me that people did not understand that. Having also read the report, I think the acronyms are confusing, um, and I can see why it, it's hard for, for the lay people to understand what was going on. So, having said that, um, I've got a draft motion, which is to say, I move that we overturn the vote of the Transportation Board to not relocate the new bus route, new Route 66 bus stop inbound on Harvard Street at Coolidge Street at 428 Harvard Street back to its original location, which is to say, um, if you vote in favor of this, we will overturn the vote of October 3rd. So, all in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Benka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? No. Selectman Wyshynski? No. And that is the and vote. And the chair votes. And the chair votes aye. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Didn't mean to miss that. All right, we have one more item of business, so good night, everybody. Leave us to our work. Members of the board. Hey, members of the board. Oh, wow. we, Walsh won. Really? Oh. By what? Are we surprised? Yeah, no. It's 51 49. Wow. Close, but I'm not surprised. Low turnout. Walsh. Really? Walsh won. Yeah. Members, we have Article 17. Anybody want to suggest? Yeah, I, I want to say I appreciate um, Mr. Farlow's um, revision on, uh, he took out the language I was concerned about, and I am uh, prepared to move favorable action on his revised uh, okay. version. Could I, could I just ask one, one question? We're looking at uh, now, uh, page 9.1, 9.2? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I had suggested uh, in the first resolve clause to uh, Mr. Bassett and Mr. Farlow uh, the language resolve the town meeting commends the Obama administration for choosing diplomacy and neg negotiations to resolve the Syrian conflict and urges it to continue vigorously pursuing this course in preference to carrying out a unilateral attack as originally proposed as opposed to instead of carrying out a unilateral attack. I'm not, um, you know, there, there's a subtle difference. Um, the uh, instead of carrying out a unilateral attack suggests that um, we are taking the position that that is not appropriate. Um, in preference to su suggest that that would be on the table. Uh, what, what, what was your substitution? It would be in preference to rather than the words instead of. Now, I will tell you, Mr. Bassett did not like that change, um, but I, um, and you know, in the grand scheme of things, what town meeting does on this resolution uh, is um, uh, probably not the most significant action that we are going to take at this town meeting. But uh, I, I just want to suggest that uh, for. Well, I will. I will just say I, I like I, I prefer <laughs> your language, but I, I having uh, since the petitioners made a substantial change. Um, in connection with the language I was concerned about, I, I, um, I, yeah. I'm willing to vote for their version now. Yeah, uh, and I, and I, I would add also, as as I said at the last meeting, I thought that their citations to the UN Charter were not correct, and I note that they have taken all of those citations yeah, out. Yeah, right. I, other comments. I agree with Selectman Daly's point of view that <laughs> while I prefer Selectman Banker's language, I think we should uh, reward the su substantial efforts that have been made given that. Yeah, uh, right. that, yeah I don't uh, think it's the, worth the difference. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we, it, had we had the opportunity to propose this earlier, um, I think maybe we could have. Well, Selectman did. Yeah. No, I, did. I, did. I, I ran it past the petitioners, oh, and in they, fairness, they were the petitioners not were not in, in favor of okay. it. So All right. I, then we have a motion um, by Selectman Daly to adopt the revised version as submitted by the petitioners. Um, and I think that's the vote before us. So all in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Sorry. It's, I want to say Wyshynski, because we all said aye. <laughs> Sorry. It's OK. Ugh. Good night. All right. This concludes the Board of Selectmen's meeting for Tuesday, November 5th. <laughs>